Okay, at well, let me make sure that this speaker is following. Um, finding out why that's not good. No. Okay, let's see. Okay. At 6.01, I will call tonight's meeting to order. This is the Capital Planning Committee of Wednesday, November 9th, 2022, 6 p.m. Ritter Building Lower Conference Room. And uh, at present, we have the Capital Planning Committee members, uh, George Martin, Matthew Brenner, Remotely, we have Peter Beardmore, and I'm Tom Alonso, the chair. Absent as of the opening of this meeting is Dave Passios. In accordance with the requirements of the open meeting law, please be advised that this meeting is being recorded and may be broadcast live over the Lunenburg Public Access channel or on Facebook Live on the Public Access Facebook page. It will be uploaded to the Lunenburg Access YouTube uh, channel uh, within 24 hours after the conclusion of the meeting. If you have a smart device and would like to join this meeting remotely via Zoom, you can do so. Tonight's webinar ID is 909-174-0347. If you do not uh, have Zoom or a smart device and like to join by phone, the phone number is 888-475-4499. And once again, the webinar ID is 909-174-0347. Uh, tonight's agenda that was posted lists all the topics which may be discussed at the meeting and are those reasonably anticipated by the chair. Votes may be taken as a result of these discussions. Not all items listed may in fact be discussed and other items not listed may also be brought up for discussion to the extent permissible by the open meeting law. So with that, I will open tonight's meeting and see if there's any opening public comment from the committee members. <clears throat> Mr. Passios. Yeah, uh, Dave Passios, member of the committee. I uh, apologize for uh, canceling out for Monday night's meeting, but I have listened to a good portion of the tape at this point. I've still got a little bit to go. Um, I only got partway through the back and forth about the parking lot at the senior center. So I need to go back and get through that entirely. But as Mr. Alonzo knows, I'm sure there was a lot of discussion about that back and forth last year. And it was pulled off of the capital plan because there had been no planning and or engineering done that. And it was said that it would come back with a, a full fledged project from my understanding. So here we are again. And, and again, I want to finish seeing the back and forth before I make any more comments. Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Any other members? Any public comment from the public? Ms. Lizio. Roger Lizio, 181 Reservoir Road. Um, I was just hoping that the presenters this evening, if they have, um, obviously I'm not privy to what, what's on your plan. It wasn't sent to me as a member of the public. I'm curious about like the big ticket items, like like maybe fire trucks and ambulances or big trucks at the DPW. Um, I wonder if you could include in your presentation if you know how much those things increase annually if we don't purchase them at the time you're requesting. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment from the public? Okay. So we have three presentations tonight. This will round out the department presentations in order tonight. We will hear from the police department and the police chief, 
fire department through the fire chief and the DPW department through the DPW director. So without further ado, I will uh, hand it over to the police chief. I will bring up, excuse me. Uh, Get to screen here. I'll bring up his report. Thought I had it running, but I guess I did not. Mine's power phone, so it should be good. <laughs> there you go. Brownie points. <laughs> Sock out. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jim Campbell, it is all yours. And just tell me when you want to go to the next slide. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I want first of all, I want to thank the committee again for having me before you to present uh, our capital plan. Um, and, it, and it's actually a future plan. It's a 10 year plan that we're looking at. Um, as a continuous review of our department's operation, we continually review what our needs are, what our fleet is, and um, that includes our equipment. Uh, the, the evaluation that we did this year, we determined that we don't um, have any capital press for FY2024. Pete, hey, just to let you know. <laughs> um, but what we did do was present a 10 year plan, <laughs> a 10 year plan um, that looking forward. Um, as always, we this is not final. It's subject to change. It, it's subject to adjustments as we move along throughout the years and as we evaluate. Um, some of the things that we do evaluate is our fleet. And I know um, this comes up quite often because of how many vehicles we have and how many that we need in the future that we will need to replace. So with that in mind, we, we have also implemented a plan that um, a, a strategy that we think that we can um, get additional years out of our cruisers and maybe prolong a life. And instead of uh, purchasing two to three vehicles, um, you know, at any given year, we can cut that back, uh, thus saving some money, um, you know, effectively saving some money. Um, as we go through this, if if there's questions, please stop, stop me, and um, I'll try to answer them the best I can. And we'll go from there. Uh, next slide, please. So as I said, um, in FY 2024, we don't have anything that we are requesting this, uh, this year for, for the next fiscal year, but FY 25, we have a regular replacement that we have scheduled. Uh, the first one would be our traffic vehicle. I'm sorry, a canine cruiser. This cruiser is, has been put off uh, quite a few years now. Um, and it's just, the vehicle's in great shape. It's a single officer cruiser and it um, outfits for our canine. Uh, we've been able to maintain this car um, and we're hoping to get another year or two out of it. Uh, the second vehicle um, is a regular replacement for our traffic cruiser. Uh, right now, he's currently using a 2019 Tahoe with 80,000, um, 80, 89,000 miles on it. Again, this is a single vehicle, a uh, single officer vehicle that we intend to hopefully get anywhere from seven to 10 years out of it once we get it on. Um, next slide, please. In FY26, again, <laughs> as you're going to see a common theme, a lot of the stuff that we are looking for is regular replacements. Um, in 2026, uh, we are also looking to replace two hybrid vehicles. Um, the first one is for the patrol uh, division. Uh, we'll replace a 2024 Explorer hybrid with a current mileage of 56,000 miles. Uh, the second vehicle, we intend to play, replace our detective vehicle. That is a 2014 Ford Explorer. It currently has 57,000 miles, and that is not a hybrid. Um, as we go through the slides, if it says Explorer, those are regular uh, gas vehicles, um, and I try to highlight the hybrids, which are hybrids. Um, I will say this as, as we move on through this. The hybrids have uh, really... Um, Helped us out this year uh, with the gas prices. We're still realizing a savings this year and what our, our fuel budget is. Um, 
I think if we had all our Tahoes back online and they were aligned cruises, we'd be in a lot of trouble with our fuel budget right now. Um, right now, that detective vehicle, that's the 2014 Explorers at the 12 year mark. Uh, by the time we are looking to replace this, um, it'll be right around the time that we need to start cycling for that one. Uh, next slide, please. Um, FY 2027, uh, this is about uh, portable radios. Uh, this is a pretty high um, year for us. Um, it's, and unfortunately, or fortunately, um, it's just the end of cycle of equipment that we're looking at. Uh, Mr. Passios has brought up um, about purchasing bulletproof vests in, in increments. And it's just, it's really hard to do it that way just because of the amount of vests we buy at one time. So we're looking at replacing our bulletproof vests. Uh, those are at the end of the cycle. Uh, we're looking at replacing our portable radios. Uh, those radios were purchased in 2020. Um, they're about the lifespan right around um, in FY 2027. Uh, with the change in technology, um, as with anything else, we need to keep up with technology and, and make sure our officers have the best equipment. <laughs> Um, we're looking at replacing two vehicles that year, and it's a regular patrol vehicles. Um, next slide, please. If we have them um, sorry. Um, uh, I'll move on to that. Uh, so those those are for yeah, please. Um, so we're looking at replacing two Ford hybrids. The current mileage right now is thirty nine thousand and fifty two four respectively. The 2021s, those are patrol vehicles and we did regular replacement for those vehicles. Uh, next slide, please. So, no, we're not looking at purchasing a self-delivery <laughs> vehicle, but wouldn't that be nice uh, if, if that was a possibility? Um, but it's something that <laughs> we just threw it in there. Um, again, if you look at uh, as the common theme here is, is these are regular replacements. We're looking to replace um, a regular patrol bureau vehicle, uh, a supervisor's cruiser, um, and these currently right now, we have a 2022 hybrid out there for the supervisors that has uh, 4,400. And the other patrol bureau cruiser is being currently being built um, or on order. So we haven't received one of those cruisers yet. Uh, next slide, please. And, Canines make everybody feel happy. Uh, again, uh, 2029. Uh, again, these are regular replacements for vehicles that we, we currently have in our fleet that we are looking to replace. Um, $80,000 for this vehicle um, would be for a school resource officer. Um, that will replace a 2017 Ford Explorer uh, with the current mileage of 41,000 miles. Again, that's a single officer vehicle right now. Um, so we try to extend life on any single officer vehicle. Uh, $20,000 replace our current duty firearms. Um, again, it's the regular replacement end of life cycle for the weapons that we currently have. Uh, next slide, please. It's pretty shameless to use puppies for something that doesn't have any pain <laughs> and stuff on. But I have you said, you have Hank. He's, he's a part of the school resource <laughs> office. Um, this, this slide here has the, the amounts of what we're looking for um, for the cruises, and which includes upfitting. Um, we also look to add a vehicle to the fleet this year. Um, as a part of our 10 year hiring plan, as we continue to grow, we are going to add a second detective. Um, as we add that second detective, we want to add a unmarked vehicle for that, that position. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this slide, no, that is not a uh, vehicle in disrepair. Uh, that is what encompasses of upfitting a cruiser. Uh, we talk about, as I go through these, I talk about what's included in the price of the vehicle and upfitting. This is just some of what goes into it. Um, there is a lot of work and a lot of equipment that go in our cruisers. And I just wanted to make sure that, that some idea that you see of what, what the work entails. Um, again, in FY uh, 2030, it includes regular replacement for a patrol cruiser. Uh, again, that vehicle would not be on the road as of yet, but I, have, uh, I wouldn't have any mileage for you there. Um, and then again, you would replace a traffic cruiser. It'd be right about that time that uh, time for replacement. Uh, next slide, please. 
So uh, <laughs> uh, a little play in the future. Uh, I sent a letter uh, for FY 2031 through 2033 in that letter. Um, it's very hard for me to say, okay, in 31, 32, and 33, what the actual replacements are going to be for the cruises. I can only guess. And if I had the DeLorean, I could go to the future and say, this is exactly what we need, and this is where we're going to be. Uh, but I do know that some of the stuff that we, we should be looking at is regular replacement for portables. It's in that lifespan. We should be looking at replacements for the line cruisers and start rotating them down to uh, spare vehicles. Uh, regular replacement for the administrative vehicles. Um, again, those can be adjusted. Uh, I've had mine probably for five, six years now, and it's still running well. Um, but again, our goal is to make sure that our fleet is in good working order and that we move to all hybrid vehicles, and, and that's a goal. Um, one vehicle with that exception would most likely be the canine vehicle and, unless we can find a hybrid that can handle the model equipment that we put in. Um, other than that, that's what I have for there. Um, next slide is our patrol motorcycle. Um, recently put on the road, that's our traffic officer there. Um, he's been getting some great press with that and he's doing a great job with it and a lot of good uh, community policing with it also. Nice. Questions? We'll open it up to the committee if anybody has any questions for the chief. Well, <clears throat> just a comment where you're looking way out into the future. I think I've been reading that GM and Ford are going to stop producing gasoline engines by 2030. Mm -hmm. So somewhere in your vision, you may have to think of if if you're forced into an electric only vehicles to have the the way to keep them charged and everything, um, I, I I think that's something that we would have to discuss with our facilities director um, because uh, it would take a lot to retrofit our buildings. Yeah, I'm only I'm only bringing it up because we're talking about 2030. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it, I I think it's something that we have to be aware of, and it was something that was, that's been brought up in the past also. Um, with technology today and with what they put in these cars, I think we'll be okay. Um, but we can't, I can't, mm -hmm. you know, again, I'll jump into the lower end. And there you go. Yes. <laughs> Bring back the sports element. Mm -hmm. The, uh, what is the total number of, of the fleet right now? Do you know? Um, we are at 17 vehicles. Okay. And you're all, in this whole process, you're looking at only adding one. Correct. Okay. So what we try to do is anytime we take a line vehicle off and put it into a spare rotation, the current spare is sold off. So we have one we're probably going to put on the NISA bid within the next month. Anybody from the committee have any other questions? Yeah, I, I have a couple of questions, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Chief, for the presentation and for the narrative that you sent. Um, could you... Uh, expand a little bit upon your um, your thinking around the school resource, resource officer vehicle. Um, I was a little bit confused. My, my understanding is, is that the plan right now is to take the current canine and move that to the school resource officer vehicle or? Correct. Um, because follow that a little bit? He has a comfort dog, so we'll move that down, but eventually that vehicle is gonna have to be cycled out. It's just, it's a 2016 Tahoe and we yeah. want to cycle that vehicle out eventually. So um, you're going to, you're going to cycle out the current school resource officer vehicle when that one comes in, the one that's being request, requested for next year? Yes, correct. Not okay. uh, the following year. Yes, correct. Right, right. 2026, okay. yeah. Or okay. 2025. 2025. And, and I, I recall, Chief, that, um, we had we had had a discussion last year about um, relating to the discussion about the, the FY23 appropriation for the canine. Um, we had added some additional funds in the budget to help take care of both dogs. Um, is the is your intent to to make the comfort dog programmatic? Uh, make you know make future comfort dogs uh, property of the town and to outfit school resource 
vehicles continually as as um, canine uh, equipped vehicles? Um, yes, absolutely. I, I think it's a viable program, and I think moving forward, it's something that we would examine in our budget and continue moving forward that way. Um, Hank only has a couple years left, like any other canine. You know, there's a shelf life. Um, so we would be looking to expand that program and, and add into it. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's worth its weight in gold. I agree. Um, can you uh, talk a little bit about the rotation program and how that's different from what, what currently exists? Uh, right now, we assign officers to cruisers. So you get a group of officers assigned to a single car, uh, and it, it rotates through. What we're looking at is rotating cars via shift. So if I have a group of officers that are working day shift, um, they have a certain amount of cruisers. The next shift that comes in picks up the cruisers that are at the station, they go out on the road. So we're hoping to get at least between 8 and 16 hours of downtime for some of those cars. Uh, currently, some of the cars are being used on a 24-hour basis, um, and it adds a lot of wear and tear to it. Um, and again, it's an experiment. We want to see how this works. If we can reduce the mileage and reduce the wear and tear, we're going to get longer life out of it, the cars, and then we can readjust this plan again. So that's a good segue to my to my next question, which is um, the the duration that we're we're keeping these vehicles seems to be longer in my mind. Um, I, I don't know if that's just my perception or if it is in fact reality. Um, and, and if it is, if that's a function of just, we've got you know a, a, a better ratio of vehicles to officers or if we're actually getting more mileage out of these vehicles. I, I think it's a combination of both. I, I think we have a solid fleet right now and um, we're, we're in great shape. I, I, I'll, I'll tell you that we're in great shape with our fleet. And I think it's a combination of both. And I think if we get this rotation in, we can get extended life out of these cars. Um, if you look how these are planned out right now, we actually, like, we push this out again, just because two factors. Number one, we are getting a lot of life out of the cars. And number two, it's taking forever to get these cars in. It doesn't make, it, it doesn't make sense. If I'm not getting a car in, in until May, uh, and then try to order another one in June or July. It's just, it's not fiscally responsible. Um, the cruisers that I had on FY23 this year, I'm probably not going to see them until after the year. It was 16 and 20 weeks when I ordered. And that doesn't include up there. Yeah. And, and just one last comment, Chief. And I, I know I mentioned something like this to you last year, and I, I raised it to the the town manager at a, at a previous uh, capital planning committee meeting. I, I would like to see in the future, or perhaps when you when you present to the finance committee, um, if you do, uh, well, I, you will obviously during budget season. Um, I think it would be great to have a visual representation of the fleet, um, even if we just use little icons for each car and a timeline for those vehicles so that we get sort of a visual representation of what's coming, what's going, and the age of those vehicles, um, because that you know I'm I'm in my fourth year trying to keep up with your fleet, and and I'm still, uh, and it's no fault of of anybody. It's just you got a lot of vehicles now, and it's hard to kind of keep an idea of okay what's coming, what's going. If you had asked me what what the size of your fleet was uh, earlier tonight, I would have told you fourteen. Um, so uh -huh. I, I I just I'm I think we need some sort of visual representation that we can then refer back to uh, um, as time goes on. A absolutely. Um, trust me, it, it does get confusing, I know, because the amount of uh, cars that we have out there, there's a lot. But what we've tried to do uh, mm -hmm. moving forward, and, and I started this a couple of years ago, is instead of looking at um, what cars are we going to replace, like the, the 204, 205, or whatever they're assigned to, we started going by years and say, okay, let, let's start pushing these out and see how we can um, adjust these, these purchases moving forward. Um, in the packet, and I didn't put it in the presentation, but in the packet, um, I sent out a list of our cruisers and what they're for. So you do have something. Oh, okay, I, I apologize, I might've missed that or. Um, I, I, will make sure that we, I don't know that we received one. Okay, I'll make sure that it comes out there. Okay, thanks Chief. 
You're welcome. I have two follow-up questions from that. The first one is, is it safe to say that the lion's share of the mileage that gets put on is from in-town driving? Yeah. Okay, yes. How has the pavement management plan affected the maintenance needed on the vehicles since they're on the road all the time? Um, outstanding. Uh, our roads and our roads are some of the best. Um, they, they're well maintained and, and not to put another community down, but we've all driven in other communities where the roads are terrible. Um, and I would hypothetically, or I would venture to guess that uh, driving those roads would cost maintenance costs to go through the road. Is there any, is there any way that you have to quantify even in the abstract, how much maintenance we've saved by doing that? Uh, not sure. That would be hard because we have a regular maintenance schedule with our cruisers and, and, and Jim Stickler from the DPW or our mechanic does a fantastic job. So it would be hard to quantify that. But I would think, um, I would think common sense would say, yes, you know, we're getting longer life out of our shocks, out of our tires, uh, suspension. Um, just based on our roads, you know, we're not we're not killing those things every time you get a pothole, um, and you're not damaging the cruisers. I'm assuming that you get from the DPW since they take care of the vehicles, you get a um, some kind of report yes. of what the maintenance. So you could look at the maintenance of the vehicles over the past few years and know. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. I think we could. But it can't it can't all be attributed to one thing. Because like I think vehicles are just more durable and engines are you know better. There's a whole bunch of factors, but it would be interesting to know what the trend of maintenance is on the vehicles in the last let's say five years. Um, if we can get that, that'd be great. It, 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 we can look at it you know, okay. and take a look at that. Um, I will say yes, vehicles are more durable today, but I do think that our roads are are just. It helps, but it really does. Well, that's why I figured I'd ask that. I don't know if it is. Yes, Mr. Pesky. I'd like to put in my annual plug. Um, and I know oh, I thought he was going to ask me for another. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, and you've heard me say this a couple of years in a row now, and I've brought it up numerous times before I was on capital planning. Um, and that's the subject of fleet management software. Fleet management software with a stroke of a few keys on a computer would give you every single piece of data that you just asked for, for all vehicles across the entire town. And I, I get, you know, oh, well, we don't, uh, we have all the receipts and stuff in a file, we would have to pull them out and correlate them and all of that stuff. Fleet management software does all that for you as long as the data is inputted. And that's one of the comments that I always get. With the size of the fleet that we now have in this town, town-wide equipment, I really think it's getting more and more and more important to see what we're getting out of these vehicles. Uh, not only police vehicles, but fire apparatus, which we're replacing and repairing quicker than ever before, uh, DPW, everything. Uh, so I'll leave it there. That That's a town-wide thing rather than one department. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the committee? Just a general question, Chief. Sure. Does a police cruiser qualify for a standard um, manufacturer's warranty like a regular yes. vehicle does? Yes. Okay. Yeah. We've had that come up a couple of times already. Okay. Anything else? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Thank, Thank you, you for the presentation. And all excellent data. Did you want to read anything from that letter? Uh, it's just the presentation itself. Okay. All right. Good. All right. Okay. And of course, as always, you are free to watch the other chiefs and every day. Yeah, I, 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 I always appreciate that kind of support. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, that that's true, but I, I'm not used to you being in here alone without being uh, without other officers. So that, so. <laughs> All right, what we're going to do is so first get rid of that, and let's go to fire uh, chief Sullivan's presentation. So give me a moment. Thank 
You would be fire, right? Oh no, that's right. You're not. See, there's ways from the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> You're a PDF. Uh, I thought we'd make it easier. I understand. <laughs> well, let's uh, let's do. Okay, Chief Sullivan, you're on. Rich, thank you. Good evening. Uh, again, like the police department's program, with a couple of exceptions, most of ours that are on here are scheduled replacements. Uh, again, we base most of the vehicles, the smaller support vehicles, on a 10 year lifespan. I just don't see quite the wear and tear that the police cruisers do because they're not getting they're getting used a little more infrequently. The larger apparatus, the pumpers, we base on a 20 year cycle. The ladder truck on a 25 and the brush fire apparatus on a 30 year cycle. So, just kind of give you an idea where the basis is for those, because again, most of those are planned replacements. And go to the next slide is just an overview of what we have over the next 10 years. Um, to answer Ms. Lissio's question, uh, I have always figured 5% on each uh, apparatus, talking to appara uh, apparatus industry reps. They say that's a pretty fair number to figure. The last couple of years with the economy has thrown that completely out the window. Um, I'm being told on ambulances figure at least 10% a year for right now. Some of the other stuff is all over the place. I've heard numbers of as much as 30%. Um, it's, it's kind of a crapshoot. But the numbers you see here are based on generally on 5%, at least for the stuff going out past the first couple of years. Chief, could I ask one question sure. relative to that same conversation real quick? Um, pricing, is it based on date of delivery or date of order? Pricing is dated on date of order. Order, order. that's that's, okay. right. that, that, that's one thing that's been spinning in my head as we push, you know, we have good reason for pushing things off in a year or two because we're getting better life, but we're also, putting ourselves up against that annual increase. And, and the other right. challenge we're seeing, as I mentioned on the first item, is that the time frame to get them right. is getting longer. Right. And longer. But, but if you don't get the order in this right. year, you don't have it for a year and a half. You don't Correct. Even have to look. Correct. You're not even on the list until you pay money. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, not in pay money, I should but, say. But you you get, money. get the order in advance. Right. Yes. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Next slide. So first item in FY24 uh, is replacing of Rescue One. I'll mention now, it's in the slides uh, later, but both Rescue One and the discussion on the radio uh, infrastructure upgrade has also been submitted under the ARPA funding as well too. And there's a little difference in the pricing that was presented there versus here. Most of that is the change in the time frame versus potentially being able to do it a lot sooner than you're looking out in the next fiscal year. So they're both accurate within the time frame that you would Correct. expect. Okay. As best we can do with the way pricing is yep. is going. So again, Rescue One is a, a 2014. It's currently got uh, a little over 85,000 miles and 4,500 engine hours. It's currently our backup ambulance. Uh, next slide. What What is the typical engine hours? Um, a little bit less than that. This truck has got higher mileage, but we're starting to see that with trucks as, as in as an example, going back again, we've gotten busier and we're going further distances. I can remember us retiring trucks at 10 years old that barely had 40,000 miles on them. So, um, so uh, I'm sorry, next slide. So the original, when we bought this truck, we went with the somewhat heavier truck chassis on it. The plan was to get the 12 year life cycle out of it. Uh, as we found that was, for lack of a better term, a failed experiment. Our maintenance costs have not been better. In fact, I think they've been worse with this vehicle. Um, we're seeing a lot of wear and tear in the chassis. 
uh, when we get to the next slide, you'll see some of the maintenance costs we've endured with this vehicle over the last few years. Mm -hmm. Originally, this was on for 2026. Um, in speaking to industry reps and talking to another department nearby who's buying an ambulance, similar to what we we're looking at, they're saying plan on 12 on two years from date of, date of order to get it. So I've moved it up two years just to get it in that 12 year time frame and that. But going forward, I think most of the vehicles are going to be looking at a 10 year lifespan for the amount of calls that we're doing, the distance that we're traveling with them, the mileage that we're putting on them. So you can go to the next slide. This is just a quick breakdown of some of the expenses with this truck. Uh, we have, I don't have the numbers off the other ambulance, but I feel like this one has definitely, we've seen more maintenance on it. And talking to other departments that have run similar uh, chassis of the International Terrastad, they've had similar issues. Uh, the one comment I had from somebody in the industry was you can't sell one of these things now. They don't make them anymore. Uh, but even a used one, nobody wants to buy them because they've had problems with them. Uh, and this has been, I mean, some of this is normal maintenance. Some of this has been oddball electrical issues. The one year with almost $11,000 was the truck was six years old and we had to do a major engine overhaul on it already. Um, we've run into some unusual uh, suspension component <laughs> issues on it, some electrical issues. And again, as an ambulance, we have to keep it maintained in 110% tip top condition. Is this diesel or gas? Yeah, uh, diesel. Diesel. It's uh, basically, it's a Ford 6 4, which was what we were trying to avoid when we bought the truck, but the international calls it something else. I mean, amortized, it doesn't look good. I mean, without one outlier of $11,000, I mean, it obviously helped because last year you had two hundred dollars on it. Yeah, and, and this year you only have eleven, and we're down at the last two months of the year. So. The records, I feel like I'm missing something in there somewhere, but you know that the repairs this year was an electrical issue already, and uh, tie rod assembly that went on it. Which, unlike the cruisers, we spend a lot of time out of town and traveling back and forth to the hospital, so we have to deal with the, the roads and other communities, and that which does do a number on the drive line. Uh, next slide, Chief. Before we move sure. on, I'm sorry. A quick scenario that was kind of talked about many years ago, and probably is less feasible today than it might have been even back then. But uh, and I'm not sure who was chief at the time. Uh, but there was conversation of rather than purchasing heavy rescues. Uh, correct me if I get this wrong, but you need a heavy rescue for fire service. And the thought process was the heavy rescue responded to fire calls and medical calls, but transports were done by a light vehicle, lighter vehicle or something to that effect. There was, there was some question as to why we were buying all heavy rescues rather than having you know, your fire response vehicle and have a lighter ambulance like the ambulance. I believe the ambulance services use I, I think I know where you're, what you're trying to say is basically as you pull, you know, a, what you call a type three ambulance that's on a truck chassis with a, a large box versus the van type chassis. The issues, A, they are cheaper. You see private ambulances on them because they are cheaper. They also crank a couple hundred thousand miles a year on them and they turn them over in three or four years. Okay. Uh, lighter construction, we can't carry all the equipment. Because again, running two to three people shift they have to take their fire gear with them. These trucks have almost no outside storage on them. So we need room for fire gear, we need room for air packs, some of the additional equipment we carry. And if you've ever worked in one of them, there's no room to work in there, especially they're, they're designed for transfer business from a hospital to facility and back, but there is very little room to work. If you notice even like Fitchburg, which their system is really a private ambulance service, they're running the, the module or the box style trucks to the, give the paramedics room to work. So the difference is that they're basically running a, a an EMS service with EMS personnel, and they're not firefighters. Which two of their ambulances, correct? Okay. They are they are run by the, they are owned by Medstar Ambulance, yeah. even though they say Pittsburgh EMS. Okay, that's enough. Okay. We're not going that direction anymore. Anyway. No. <laughs> it, it no, not really a savings in the long run, and it'd be difficult. So again, the replacement, uh, that's a picture of our current rescue too. The truck we'd be looking at would be similar to that, an F-150 
an F model four wheel drive uh, modular plan would be a 10 year lifespan on the vehicle. And with the next slide, what we usually do with them is the new unit comes in, runs front line, goes out first for the first five years. The other truck rotates to the backup ambulance that goes out when the first truck is out on the road on another call. Uh, so it's not getting used quite as much. And the plan is to get another five years out of that for a 10 year total lifespan. And like I said, we've seen this year, our runs are up significantly. Uh, I think we're going to clear the year with about 1,500 calls, which we haven't seen in a few years. Uh, the other thing we're seeing with more activity is with the private ambulance service, not having the staff and people, the fire departments are picking up the extra slack. So what we're all finding, not just us, is we're spending time in each other's communities. So it's just, again, more wear and tear on the trucks, more running around. So... Uh, my slides here. Again, it would rotate. The thought would be to take this existing unit that we have rescued, the 2014 unit. We would hang on to that, replace the 1998 ambulance that currently serves as the water rescue truck. That was a 1998. It's been the water rescue truck since 2009. Uh, that one is definitely getting tired. It's older than some of the people that are riding on it now. Uh, this truck. I would anticipate another 10 to 15 years lifespan out of that because it's not going out constantly. It's going out maybe once or twice a month. Um, it's not going to see the you know the beating on it that the other that it was taking as an ambulance, and it's got a little bit more storage room that it would function pretty well as a multi-purpose vehicle for that. The plan all along has been to rotate one of the ambulances in to take the place of that. The last time we didn't when we bought Rescue Two because the truck that was being retired had a similar motor, that truck actually had a lot of issues when we got rid of it. So it was, we felt it was just better to keep running the other truck until this one came along. How much maintenance goes into the, the, uh, what do you Go call it? Um, truck. The what? The truck that, so you're gonna, you're gonna take this ambulance and you're gonna take the back off of it and turn it into a, a, a water truck, right? No, no, it would, the, when we converted the other truck, it cost us about $500 total. If the truck still looks the same, we do a little bit of change around inside so we can mount some of the water rescue gear and add a trailer hitch to it. Other than that, we're not taking the body off. We're not making massive changes to the truck. Okay, so, what, water truck. It's no, it's a water rescue. Water rescue vehicle. It carry, we tow the boat, carries the scuba equipment, carries the ice water rescue suits, stuff like that. Right, I, I understand what it is. Um, my my question is the the existing vehicle um, is a is a twenty odd year old vehicle, correct? Correct. And how frequently is that vehicle deployed, and and what do we spend to maintain that vehicle? It gets deployed between drills and actual callouts, probably once to twice a month. Uh, it may travel anywhere in the district because it's part of a regional team. Maintenance on it hasn't been horrible, uh, but like a couple of years ago, we had a belt fail on it that tore up the engine compartment. We had to fix that. We've had to put tires on it. Uh, as when some mechanic figured out the tires were almost 20 years old on it. Uh, again, it's still going to be maintained. It doesn't have to be maintained to the same level of an ambulance, but it's still going to be maintained so it runs. And it's okay, getting so old, it's getting tired. I would suspect having driven it myself, you'd be looking at a transmission down the road because it just, it doesn't get out of its own way anymore. Okay, so for all the, for all of the maintenance issues that we're currently suffering with Rescue One, you believe that, and I'm projecting here, I'm not, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm just trying to get my head around the issue because you referred to the chassis and the issues around that, that, that truck several times by repurposing that vehicle you still think we're going to get a longer lifespan and and lower maintenance costs out of the repurposed vehicle than we will out of the current water rescue truck going out 12 to 24 times a year versus two to three hundred times a year yes okay and trade-in on stuff now is they don't want to give give you anything on it. The other, the old truck, I'd say, just 
sell it outright from time I get 500 bucks for it. Any any questions on rest and one? Okay, uh, next slide. Next thing, which is sort of new on here, is uh, beginning to update the radio system for police and fire. This is not what Chief Gamble was talking about, about the portables. This is what we actually call the backbone of the system, the repeaters uh, that when you transmit out a portable, it's going out to these units and then getting broadcast out to everyone else. Uh, again, it's on, it was submitted for under ARPA money to replace both systems simultaneously. And there's some cost savings there uh, versus spreading it out over two years on the capital plan. I was asked to submit it that way. Uh, but basically it replaces outdated radio infrastructure. It would improve some radio coverage in parts of town where we don't have the greatest coverage right now. And again, doing it in two phases, it would replace it for either police or fire in one year and the other agency in the next. To explain this a little more in the next slide, uh, you may remember we had money placed on there for both departments several years ago for a potential radio migration. There was a change in a federal law that they were going to reallocate some bandwidth, and it was going to force us to move off of our radio frequencies. So we had money put aside to do that. Now, the, or we had plans to do that. In 2020, the mandate was repealed by the feds. So we don't have to change our radio frequencies. Along with that, there was conversation of where we're part of the regional uh, dispatch center about developing out a regional radio network that all the towns would share. Uh, as things have gone on and the district agreements have been updated, one thing that's been stated in there is the towns are responsible for their own radio infrastructure. Grant money is tighter and tighter for the centers like that to be able to cover a huge area. So that was another thing that for, made me look at putting this back on there as we had hoped that maybe it could be done that way. That avenue was closed to us. Uh, next slide. The other thing that concerned me a little bit more is speaking with uh, one of the radio vendors that sells the equipment. The equipment was originally put in 2009, 2010. And again, firefighter, you know, we'd still have the horses and still use them if we could find guys to take care of them. You kind of think that this stuff lasts forever. Like Chief Gamble said with the radio, with his portables, this equipment wears out. The manufacturer considers what we have obsolete and they're discontinuing making parts. So as time goes on, it's gonna be harder and harder to get parts for the radios if they do break. We've been fortunate, they've stayed up pretty well. Uh, other than a lightning strike a few years ago that took out some equipment, we've done well. But if something fails, it's harder and harder to replace that. Uh, next slide. So the system basically it would replace the existing repeaters, which basically when you transmit in, it goes to that. You transmit on your, your five watt portable, it goes to that transmitter and then gets broadcast back out at 100 watts. So everybody can hear you really well. It, it works well. We have a transmitter up in the water tank on Sunny Hill Road, and we have a backup one in the top of Town Hall. It would replace both those units. It would also take the three other sites that we have, which are called receiver sites, which when you transmit out on your portable, it picks that up, sends it through microwaves back to the transmitter, and then the transmitter again puts it out at 100 watt. The challenge there is, is like, like I can be down by say PJ Keating's, I can talk on my portable, it goes to the receiver site down in Lemons to Shirley Road, they hear me fine. I can't hear the repeater because it's all the way up in the water tower on Sunny Hill Road and the line of sight isn't that good from there. So we have problems there. Changing these receiver sites to what they call simulcast or voter sites allows that it's good. They're, they can basically transmit or receive. And when it detects a signal, whichever one's the strongest, that one will broadcast. And it fills in a lot of these dead spots that we have in our system. So right now the receiver sites of Town Hall uh, we, we co-share a location on top of Manusnock Hill with Lemonster Fire, and we have a receiver site down in the Lemonster Shirley Road pump station. So it would make those capable of transmitting and receiving, and would also add a uh, transmitter repeater site potentially on the Chase Road water tank, which would fill in a lot of the area down Mass Ave towards White Street 
area, which is a kind of a somewhat dead spot for us. So it, it puts up new infrastructure that's state of the art, that's expand, uh, expandable somewhat. You can go to the next so slide. How do, you, how do you deal with these sites now? With these sites now, there's areas where you know that you may have to speak clearly on the radio. Uh, you may have to go back and use the vehicle radio, which is usually like 25 to 50 watt instead of the portable. We, we sort of know where they are and we work around them. But again, it can be an issue. Sure. Garble transmissions, what did you say? You know, things like that. Uh, yes, you can go to the next slide. So again, this covers the upgrade to do one agency because the infrastructure, it's two separate units next to each other, police and fire. They're not all one unit. So again, under the ARPA money, the plan was to do both at the same time. Um, if we did it in two years under capital, we'd be upgrading the second agency in FY25. And that, but again, improves coverage and poor reception areas. And the newer technology is somewhat more upgradable that in future years, if something becomes available, we can add sites to into that to improve better coverage. So the north, northwest and east ends of town, those are somewhat weak. There's not really anything good right now to put a, a radio on to fill those in, but in the future there might be. So uh, hey, Chief on the on the radios, can you um we don't we don't have to go back on the slides necessarily, but I I seem to have a gap in my memory around the, I thought we made an appropriation two or three years ago around this infrastructure. And I think you just alluded to that or referred to it. But it was on the plan. We never appropriated any money. We did not appropriate. Oh, it was in, it was, would have actually been coming up around this time. It might've been FY 20, 21 or 22 without going back. But we had removed, when, when the mandate went away at the time, we're like, okay, we might be able to do this through the, uh, the dispatch center. I had taken them off the capital plan and Chief, uh, or I think at the time, Chief Marino had taken it off the capital plan. Okay. Then we, again, found more information that, okay, we need to, we need to look at this before it becomes a, a crisis. Okay. And then my other question, um, and I know that you're, you're, limited in terms of the creativity you can do for communications because you're highly regulated obviously here. Um, but in, you know, in the civilian world, there's, there's lots of technology that can allow for multiple channels over the same radio simultaneously. Um, is that even an option here or do you literally have to put in two parallel systems for two agencies? Some of, the, some of the technology, and part of this is also looking at being able to have a backup channel for each department. Police currently have one. Uh, we don't. We're hoping to be able to share one with the, through the dispatch center to be able to tie in for communications. There is some potential for, and I'll be the first to admit, I'm not a radio guy. I, I push the transmit button and hope somebody answers me. Uh, <laughs> talking with the vendors, people who are way smarter with me, yeah, there is some way to combine some of this but it can't be all one, one box. There's other things that are involved there. Okay. Like I said, I'm, I'm not a radio guy. The gentleman that I talked to is very smart and he could give Mr. Spock a migraine. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions on radio? We're also operating at town government frequency. Uh, we're operating actually in separate police and fire. The old town, old three four three that you remember. We yeah. still yeah. the town is still licensed for that, but that's high band. We're operating up on UHF. We sort of maintain okay. that as a backup. DPW system. What are they offering? You guys are going to UHF if I remember correctly too. You guys are piggybacking yeah. off the water districts frequencies, and we're looking at one of their spare frequencies. So those are all UHF. We keep, we have some radios. Neshoba does not monitor the old VHF, but we still maintain it. We still have some radios that will function on that. And that's kind of the old crap backup yeah. that, that we can still use it. Right. The problem, we looked at that for them. The challenge is, is now, if they have a problem, they can't talk to us directly. Right. And that while well, they're on UHF, we can all change the channel and talk to each other. Right. Plus I believe that works with the school radios too. They're in the UHF range. So a lot of that is interoperability 
amongst all the departments and other agencies. Like every, for us on the fire side, every town around here is UHF with the exception of, I think, one. So it's easy for us. We don't have to carry three different radios. Uh, just a little bit on years going out. FY25, we moved the replacement uh, of the chassis on the, the small brush truck out. We've been kind of kicking that can down the road, but honestly, that truck isn't super busy. Uh, it's a 1989. Uh, eventually, we're going to run into a problem with that. Something's going to fail on it. But we've been able to push that down. It's still running fairly well. And again, just like we talked in years past, we've talked about plans to take the body off and just remount it on the new chassis. The body's in really good shape. That's only from 2012. And that works out really well for us. And that was the plan all along is we just have to get a, a cabin chassis and put it underneath there. But those have been, last year it was we couldn't even get a good number on what the chassis would cost, what the materials were, how long it would take. I think you guys are finding out it's still not that much better. That's part of the problem with the ambulances is it's not building them, it's getting the chassis for them. So that's that's a bad a best guess target number for that. Again, when we finally get it pinned down, even this year, we started looking at it. We moved it when we realized we need to move up the ambulance on there, but we were having trouble even getting good numbers on that this year. Next slide. The other thing for FY25 will be the phase two of the radio infrastructure, basically will be completing the project for the other department. Uh, the cost figure in there is phase one plus 30%, which is what I was told by the radio vendors. Anticipate that for an increase. You see that probably the worst case scenario. It could be less, but it's a volatile market and nobody knows what the, you know, what the pricing is gonna be like. If anybody's bought anything lately, it's, it's, a, it's best guess. So uh, next slide. FY26 uh, involves uh, this is a planned replacement of the duty officer uh, fire prevention vehicle. It's currently uh, an Explorer. We'd be looking to replace that with the same same type of vehicle. It could very easily be a hybrid for what we do. Um, the mileage, that one, I think we're going to be on target for its age. That one's the mileage is currently at a little over 77,000 miles on it. This vehicle does a lot of local driving. It's also something when we're sending people to the academy. If they have to drive the stow, they can take that because we can put three or four new people in it, take their equipment with them. So that car does get some mileage put on it. Uh, next. Let me know when that goes to municipal. <laughs> <laughs> that would say, <laughs> that one, I, I will say this, and, and I'll say this with any of the smaller vehicles, or any of these vehicles, these are all planned replacements. They can move, like I said, like with the ambulance, we're finding that we may need to do that one sooner. Some of these other vehicles, like I'll, I'll say, you know, for FY27, we have the car that I use, you know, FY26 is car two. Both of those vehicles are held up extremely well so far. Beyond basic normal schedule maintenance, we've had no more, almost no issues with them. The same with the pickup truck. And with the other two vehicles being used, the pickup sees most of its use plowing the parking lot and towing some of our trailers when we have to go somewhere. That truck doesn't get beat up as much. So, those three vehicles really, those may end up getting moved around as we get closer and we'll see how we're doing. I've been very happy with all three of those compared to their predecessors. Yeah, and, and that's one thing that I've been personally happy about uh, the department heads. You know, th this is the on paper plan, but it's reviewed every single year or even half year, depending on what's happened unexpectedly with these vehicles. And there is movement one way or the other under the circumstances. So that's really important, I think, for uh, fleet managing and cost of fleet managing. Yeah, obviously, the big ticket one in that year would be the, the planned replacement of Squad 3. That's a 2008. Uh, that's a rescue pumper. That goes through motor vehicle accidents, uh, any kind of physical entrapments. It carries, a, you know, in addition to be a regular fire truck with hose, water, tank, uh, pump, it's also got the jaws of life. It's got heavy lift airbags, power tools, saws, uh, all kinds of extrication equipment. That truck probably sees my road mileage wise the most of any of the, the big fleet because it's always going out the door to car accidents and chasing around with that. And that one, the price tag is usually probably a little bit more than a typical pumper only because it's a specialized vehicle. It's got the extra compartmenting on it. It's got the equipment to carry the, the uh, some of the rescue tools. 
The rescue tools are going to be going more towards all battery powered. So I would not imagine this one's going to require as big of a generator or a built-in pump for the hydraulics. Uh, and there's a lot of new things that are coming along with those the smaller body pumps. You can make the truck shorter or have more storage space. And again, that number was based out 5% a year from when we bought the current vehicle. And you know, we're going to have to assess that number as we get a little bit closer and figure out where, where we're going with that. And like I said, they're all scheduled replacements. What is in the vehicle R1 that makes it uh, very close to what that M1 is, which is... I, again, that, that is an estimate on cost based out. Again, uh, that's the car I use. If I'm not in town or if I'm away, I leave it to the deputy or one of the captains. Uh, computer, uh, command console that's got plans, whiteboard, extra computer setup. It's also equipped with an air pack. Uh, Jaws, uh, not Jaws of Life, I'm sorry, air pack, first aid kit, defibrillator, because uh, it's a response vehicle. It's, I always say it's compared, you, know, you see a lot of the city departments of like the chief may drive like a Ford 500 or something. But here in town, our size, even with being staffed all the time, it runs more like a city deputy's vehicle that you're going on a lot of calls. And that, which is why we went with the larger vehicle too. So, uh, FY28 would be the planned replacement of Rescue 2, the 2019 vehicle. Again, the pricing is based out from the, re the current Rescue One estimate, which the Rescue One estimate, uh, the price was on the ARPA funding was what Devon's uh, Fire is buying an ambulance currently. They were looking at basically the exact same truck. And the price I used is that, that same price minus one piece of equipment that we already have and don't need to replace. And that, that number is based out from there. We'll probably be looking at the same type of vehicle. And again, it's planned replacement at a 10 year age when it would come in. That new vehicle would rotate to be the primary ambulance. Rescue one would rotate to be the backup ambulance again. And then we don't have anything for a few years. And then the next thing that would come up currently in FY32 would be engine five, the heavy duty brush truck. Um, this was actually our first AFG, well, one of the first AFG grants for vehicles that was out there. So if I remember right, the town only paid about $50,000 for that truck. And that it's a planned replacement at 30 years old. And again, that could be, that's gonna be something that would get assessed as we get closer. Currently, that truck's serving us well. It's other than when it tried to catch on fire one day, it's maintenance has been pretty, uh, pretty minor. Uh, we've done well with it. And, you know, again, that's gonna be just basing it at, a, at the 30 year mark and we'll have to assess where we're at on that. I mean, as far as other items, I can mention a couple of things that are on there right now. And I couldn't honestly tell you if they're gonna be there someday. Uh, we talk about things like a third ambulance. Right now, I don't see it, but if our calls start to go up again like they are and they continue to rise, that could be an issue down the road. The problem we run into at this point is we have no more room. The building is maxed out. So those, you know, that's something like that. Uh, we're on the cusp of going paramedic. Uh, what that's going to increase for us, assisting other communities, like they've done for us for a long time. Whether that's going to kick into something down the road, whether we're going to want to think about what they call an intercept vehicle, which is basically like a Tahoe or an Explorer that you can meet and go do paramedic work in somebody else's truck. And that you're just carrying the equipment. You're not taking an ambulance with you. I don't see the need for that right now. Five or six years from now, that could be something we could be talking about, but I don't know where we're going to be yet with that. The whole EMS end of it has changed substantially around here in the last few years with between the pandemic, the decline of the private ambulance services that's in the area. Uh, you're seeing a lot of the emergency EMS moving towards the fire side. Lemons the Fire is now running paramedics. They run them into the intercept vehicle. When we go online with our medics, hopefully within the next few weeks, uh, like I said, we're helping each other out a lot more. So a lot of the towns are running in the intercept vehicles if they're doing ALS for a lot of other people. And But they, they already have a transport vehicle like we've done for years. Not something I, I can say that I'm going to be talking to you next year on, but it's something, you know, if you see it in three, four, five years, okay, but I'm not going to even think about bringing stuff like that full until I get the data to back it up. So I'm waiting to see what happens. Hey, Chief, given those 
changes that you're referring to relating to EMS. Um, has there been any change in terms of billing and, and you know? Not yet. Stay tuned. <laughs> That'll be a conversation once we get up and working at the paramedic level that I will be having. Okay. But I mean, I'm talking in terms of not, not, not pr procedural or technology or anything like that. I'm talking actual revenue. Are we billing more as a result of any of this? Also, yes, because we're, we're busier and we're transporting more. So basically the bill goes to whoever's transporting the patient. So the more we're transporting, the more we're starting to bill. What you'll see also as we start running our own paramedics, we're not paying for the paramedic service to other towns or other agencies. So that money is going to be staying here instead of going out of town because we'll be doing that ourselves. I mean, so my, and my understanding is, is that, I mean, your budget is your budget and that money basically goes back to the general fund, right? That is correct. I mean, I, in, in my mind, and this is something that, you know, perhaps our select board rep could perhaps pursue when the time is right is, you know, if, if increases in calls and increases in mileage are resulting in shorter replacement cycles, you know, perhaps we need to look at fiscal policy relating to billing to help, you know, uh, sustain the, the, the capital requirements that this is, uh, that this is putting on us. It's probably not a conversation for here, but I can say with the billing and it's going to be a conversation I have with the board yep. about increasing some of the rates. But one thing to remember is a lot of things like the Medicare, Medicaid, mass health, the government supported insurances is they have a set rate. We can build whatever we want, but we have to accept what they pay. And the last couple of times we've done the statistics on that in town, that's probably about between 60 and 65% of our build ambulance transports. So we can increase our rates and I'm not saying we shouldn't, but you, I, I, think, I think I've said it to the board before, we're never gonna make it an enterprise fund. Yeah, I look at it as it's offsetting the cost of the people we have to provide that service and to provide fire protection. That makes sense. No, it makes sense. <laughs> I hear exactly what you're saying. And any other questions? Any other questions from the committee? Well, Chief, thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Thank you. If we have any follow-up questions, we will make sure we get them to you. And, and if it will help, Tom, I'll send you. You want it? As an no, no, not now. I'll point no, no, no. in the future reference. Yes, if anything now, it gets <laughs> easier. Okay. It's easier. So I'm not scrolling. I can just there you go. Facebook. Uh, all right, let's stop sharing for a second while we get ready for the. Uh, you can sit here if you'd like so you can see the screen. Okay. That might work too. All right. Well, we have the DPW director. Let me get that set up. Uh, so which one are you going to be going over first? Equipment. Equipment first. Okay. And infrastructure second. Okay. Okay. So uh, I didn't. I didn't remind people for the, the, the two days, but please introduce yourself first when we, when we start, but let's get to the screen. Uh, and share again. Okay. You won't want to steal anything from a car. Okay. Yes, we will. Hey, Bill, it's all yours. All right. Well, thank you. So uh, my name is Bill Bernard. I'm the uh, new DPW director. And I thank the committee for um, hosting this tonight and hearing me. Uh, so I have two presentations. One is for uh, DPW equipment, and one is for DPW infrastructure. So go to the next slide. So I kind of tried to lay it out by year. And I tried to make it as even as possible. So it was roughly $525,000 per year, a uh, couple of gap years there. Um, 
guess we can go to the next one. <laughs> we'll start with FY24. So right now, our biggest need is uh, the big trucks, the, the salt trucks, the, the plow trucks. So we have seven routes for plowing and salting. So we need seven trucks. Uh, presently, four of the seven trucks are out of service. So we need trucks bad. So this is our, um, this is a 2008 International. This one has a blown motor. So in FY22, there was money for a big truck. In FY23, there was money for a big truck. Those trucks have been ordered. They're a year out. Yeah. So, so, so to be clear, Mr. Bernard, the, the, the FY24 request, the, the, the previous appropriations though, are to replace other trucks, not the one that's got a blown motor right now. Right, that's two other trucks that are out of service. Yeah. So that your your narrative in the description leads me to ask the question, even though it's out of the scope of this committee, but I'm going to ask it anyway. So if you have seven routes and you have six trucks, then what is what are you going to do if we're not going to get one for two years? So we've ordered um, a couple of smaller spreaders for our smaller one ton trucks. So that's going to make up a little bit of the difference. And we're going to have to rely on contractors more this year and next year. Again, out of our scope, but a truck sit given, and this is a given because I, I mean, an assumption because I don't know the rest of the condition of the vehicle. But you have a vehicle sitting that needs an engine. Has it been explored as to what it costs to pull that engine? get a used engine in and drop an engine into it. I mean, I see that done every day in private, in the private sector. Yeah, so we recently sent um, what's this truck, not this truck, one of a, a twin to this truck to a dealer. We thought we could, you know, put a little bit of money into it, get it running this year. They started going through it and the list just grew and grew and grew and grew. And they eventually said, we can't touch this truck. We can't make this truck work. Right? And, and the cost of repairs would be more than the truck is worth. And they weren't willing to even go that route. Okay, I'll leave it alone. Yeah. It, it, as you know, it's something yeah. that can be done, but in municipal realms and, and other things, uh, it makes it impossible. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, in, in that same vein, I'm sure this truck, if we started to really look at it, it would be more than just the motor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we'll go to the next slide. So the next slide is, is a twin. This is the one that we sent down for repairs, right? Um, this is the one that they said, no way. It's, it's just too far gone. So we'd be looking in FY24 to, to replace two trucks. Go to the next Mr. Slide. Mr. Bernard, with respect yes. to the, the trucks that we're um, replacing, and I, I know you weren't here, so this isn't personal and I'm not shooting the messenger. I'm just trying to look for information here that you might have. Um, first, were those trucks, those trucks were not scheduled for replacement this year on previous capital plans, were they? That I don't know. Okay. You have to look look at the records. Peter, honestly, I don't remember them, but again, we'd have to look back. I may have the files in the last two years. Right. So, I mean, as a general comment, and I don't know that there's any way to, to reply to this, but I mean, it is concerning given the age of those vehicles and the mileage that, you know, they're dead. Um, and, you know, Mr. Passio has made a comment um, relative to fleet maintenance in an earlier discussion. I know that you've got a very good mechanic. I know that there is some kind of record keeping that goes on there. Mr. Passio's and I were involved in detailed discussions over the last couple of years with the Finance Committee and your predecessors relating to maintenance. Um, 
you know, and, and we've gotten all kinds of assurances, um, but we have two trucks that are, you know, comparative to other vehicles in that, in that space, they did not get to their lifespan or their mileage and they're dead. And I just, I'm, I'm a little bit bewildered as to how we got to this point. Right, so obviously I can't speak to what happened in the past, but uh, the, and on top of the mileage, the, these trucks, man, when it snows, they're turned on, they don't shut off until they're, you know, the, the storm's over and we're done plowing. So there's a lot of hours on them too. So hours is the same as mileage. So these, and the, the, the trucks have pushed hard, right? They're carrying salt, they're pushing snow. It's a it's tough duty for trucks. It, but in your experience, I mean, you you worked you worked for the state previous to coming to Lunenburg, correct? Yes. What is a what is a, a truck of similar size that goes up and down Route 495 or whatever? I mean, how much mileage do those get? That they might get a little bit more mileage, but they're not getting many more years. So they're probably getting equivalent years. Okay. Well, that's a that's a good comparison. Obviously, I'm not from the space, but you know, it it surprises me when I see large vehicles like this that, you know, in the commercial space, you know that they get several hundred thousand miles. It it just it strikes me as odd. I have a question, Mr. Bernard, and that is uh, obviously these vehicles that you're showing us are pretty concerning, as Mr. Beardmore said. Have you done a full analysis of all the vehicle fleet and where we are with those? Because I, I think it, it seems to be pretty self-apparent that these were not put out for replacement where clearly they should. And again, you're new to this, so mm -hmm. you know I would look to your predecessors, but I wanna make sure we're not gonna come to this next year. Have you done a full assessment of the fleet? Yeah, I think my first slide kind of showed that. I looked at all the vehicles and kind of projected out their lifespan and put them in, you know, for replacement. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the bigger trucks, uh, what did I look at? About, you know, 15 years, give or take. And the smaller trucks, about 10 years. Okay. That's what we're looking at. Final, very quick question. How much additional wear and tear are going to be uh, seen on these one tons now out salting the roads? I mean, that's going yeah. to exasperate that fleet. So yeah. It's, it's, you know, yeah. Mr. Alonzo's point, we're going to see a ripple effect through the whole fleet until we get caught up with this properly. That's right. Right. We'll be general general comment. Yeah. 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 We'll be putting more weight on them. And yeah, use them a little harder than in the past. Next. Yep, uh, we're on this slide. Yep, oh. uh, it's number three in FY24. Uh, this truck was the director's truck. Um, I'm not driving it, and basically because I'd be putting too many miles on it, and this truck can't take the miles. So right now, it's uh, one of my facilities guys is using it. It's uh, kind of tough for him to use this truck. He's, it's, he's got all kinds of equipment in the front seat with him instead of uh, a utility truck with you know the utility body where the equipment should be. Um, so we'll be looking for a, a, a smaller truck for the director. So a, you know, like a half ton truck, something a little more fuel efficient. This is a half ton truck. Isn't it? This is a three quarter ton truck that's that we have now. Yeah, three quarter ton single cab. Yes. Oh, the current one, right? So yeah. you're looking. Well, yeah. So yeah. we replace this truck. I thought you were talking three. about the replacement. No, yeah. Yeah. Bill, yeah. so we had a utility truck. Where'd it go? Because the former DPW director was driving. That's what I'm driving now. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I didn't. Right. We have two utility trucks. They, should be with the two facilities guys. Right. Okay. Right. Yep. All right. Next. Yep. We okay. can move on. 
So this is uh, now we're in fiscal 25. So replacing our next um, big salt truck, plow truck. Um, this one is a 2008. Um, this one here has issues. <laughs> we're hoping it makes it through this winter. It's, it should, but I can't guarantee it. <clears throat> but this only has 46,000 miles on it. Right. But again, lots of hours, lots of hard work, yeah, yeah. Right? pushing snow, carrying the salt. Yeah. yeah, that's the difference between running down 495 at 45, 50 miles an hour for 60 miles yeah. versus running around on streets that are no more than a mile long. Yeah. I've been behind those trucks at 495. There's no that, 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 40 miles an hour. <laughs> 25 miles an hour. Yeah, that matters. Maybe 30. Yeah. Oh, I'm not something to 50 or 60. Can, can I ask you a question? You may. Are we, as a town, are we getting away from putting salt down on the roads? Have we gone to like this chemical stuff that they run down the middle of the road now? We haven't. We got away from the sand. So we're right now we're running straight salt. Okay. Right. When it was a sand salt mix, we were actually probably using the same amount of salt. Plus, we were putting down sand, which we had to sweep up, which was also going into our catch basins, which we had to clean. And yeah. just sand is gritty, so it's wearing away the pipes and the road. So it's best to get away from the sand. Yeah. So, so there are other technologies out there. Um, I know Mass DOT likes to, to pre treat the roads with uh, liquid yeah. calcium, uh, not cal Car magnesium chloride. Car killers. Yeah, the, yeah. yeah. the uh, calcium chloride kills the cows, magnesium is not as bad. And the other thing that MassDOT does, which we could look at, but it, again, it's another capital investment, is um, they put saddle tanks on the salt truck. So as the salt's falling out, we're spraying it with the magnesium chloride. And so it'll work at lower temperatures and it works better, it works immediately. Mm -hmm. So you use less salt. Okay, so to your earlier response where it's, we're still more or less putting traditional salt down? Yes. Okay. Yeah, right. Now, I don't know, not too many communities uh, in states are using the other kind of things like the bear brine kind of stuff. And yeah. Is guess. there any um is there any evidence that going to pure salt, and you speculated that probably the same amount of salt at the end of the day, um, that that's causing more rapid deterioration on the DPW vehicles? Well, I don't think so, because like I said, they were probably using the same amount of salt before when they were also using sand. So one of the things we do after every storm is we do wash down the trucks to try to, to stop the corrosion. You know, you can only do so much, though. They're still corroded pretty bad. And we don't have wash rack facilities, right? These are... Like you know that you would you would see it like a you know a military installation or a truck stop to walk, to spray these things down, do we? No, we do not. So we're using the, the garden hose you know, inside the garage. Yeah. So we're not using a pressure washer. We're just using we the have, garden hose. No, we have a pressure washer oh, too. Yeah. 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 Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, George, just a quick comment to what you inquired about a few minutes ago, and and I don't know what product they were using, but Route Two Way through Acton. A few years ago, they were using a liquid. I don't know what it was, but the next, I think they used it two seasons in a row. By the second season, every single seam in the hot top deteriorated and the roads just crumbled. Mm -hmm. And they attributed it to whatever they treated the road. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right, so this is a, a new purchase. This would be a second front end loader. Um, I already saw it myself. Uh, we were getting salt deliveries. Our current loader, which this is a picture of our current loader, it got a flat tire three days in a row. So we had salt piled outside. Uh, I know last year they were telling me a couple of times, you know, it's, the loader is used to 
load the salt trucks in the yard, but it's also used out on the road sometimes. So the truck might you know, bear off the road a little bit. You got to pull it out. We use the loader for that. So having a, an extra loader, a second loader, would go a long way in helping our operations. Do you have internal space for these? I know the fire chief was talking about it. There are certain vehicles that like, he's maxed out. Yeah. If the we new would, DPW garage, would you have room for one or is this going to be stored outside? We'd be very tight. Yeah. But something like this, we would keep inside though. Okay. Yeah. Something else would get bumped out from most likely. Probably. Yeah. Oh. Oops. Uh, next one, I guess. Uh, I'm going to talk about this. I did this the uh, compressor. Oh, good slideshow. Oh, well, oh, there it goes. Yeah, a little bit of a delay. All right. This is also a new purchase. Um, so we do a lot of uh, catch basin repair. And right now we, we don't have a jackhammer. So the, the saw cutting, they're using the backhoe. It's not the, the best way to go about doing things. Um, Air compressor um, would be great for other work. Um, just you know, with a blowpipe, it's you know, for cleaning up. Uh, we don't have a cement mixer; they're, they're mixing by hand. So this would be um, very helpful stuff for us. It's uh, stuff we'd use often. These the is that the combined estimate for the three things that you have there? It is, which I think is a little bit on the low side. I think okay. The compressor okay. might be a little bit higher. So I'm 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 looking for, and I'm I'm wondering what the other committee members might think about this because I I I saw another item, uh, maybe it was in this presentation or a different one that that caught my eye. Um, and I understand like when we need to make a bulk purchase of police vests, for example, and it costs twenty-five dollars or $30,000, that is what it is. It's a single purchase. In my mind, as I look at this, these are three different purchases um, that if left to individual purchases would fall below the $20,000 threshold. Um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm just throwing that out there. I don't, Really have a strong opinion on it, other than I'm I'm just I'm wondering if this bundling is counter to the policy that the select board adopted last year. Uh, yeah, I, I could see your point. Luckily, we don't have to decide this year because this is a 2025 purchase. Yeah. But but your point is well taken. Yes, we we I, I'm not fond of bundling to make things go above the. Uh, the capital plan threshold they should be they should have been itemized the only thing peter i would add to uh the conversation on this is that we have had conversations in the past when we were talking about increasing the threshold that say in the realm of uh, exterior buildings if a package was put together by facilities to address uh, the outside of three or four different buildings with small amounts applied to each building as one project, that that would be, you know, in our eyes was okay, but they're all, you know, work that's the same realm and accomplishes a very important goal. And, and I agree with you here. These are more or less three completely separate items. Yeah, I mean, somebody's got to call balls and strikes on this at some point. But and, and I was thinking exactly the same thing, Dave. Like, I mean, when you look at the cameras and the stuff for the windows for the schools and that kind of thing, if you spread it out across three buildings, you probably drop below the threshold on one or two of those, right? So, um, but but I, you know, personally don't have a problem with bundling that kind of thing. So, I I understand that this is probably a little bit gray. Um, I'm just calling it out for future discussion. Sure. Next. Yep. And so noted. I'll, I'll keep that in mind going forward. All right. This is fiscal 26 to replace this um, one ton utility body truck, which is um, basically out of service now already. Um, 
you know, like I said, I tried to keep the spending about five and a quarter per year. So this one, I kind of pushed out. Uh, we can kind of get a little, we're getting away without using this. Um, mostly because we, you know, we had one guy that's out sick, so the, his truck is available. So, but he should be coming back soon. So we're going to be a little bit short. It, it, a little confused. We have a vehicle that is non-functional. What is the plan between now and the time its replacement arrives? We're going to, at some point, put enough money into this to get it functional, or is it going to sit and rot and um, we'll put it on municipal when the new vehicle? Yeah, I think we'll put it on municipal now. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, that uh, that was the true yeah. question. Are we going to yeah. get rid of it now, or are we going to hang yeah. on in case? I will add a comment, an editorial comment, that while I can appreciate the fact that you may want to keep spending even, I would say there's a higher priority to get the department functioning, and that vehicles that are no longer in service would get replaced and the, the ones that are out of service get rid of one way or another. Right. So I would prioritize functionality of the department higher than mm -hmm. let's keep the budget even over years. I mean, it's good yeah. to do it if you have the flexibility to say, you know what, it's fine, it'll last another year. But if it's coming to us and saying, I mean, this is the third vehicle. Second vehicle, it's definitely down. The other six wheeler is mm -hmm. questionable at best. And uh, in, in a different venue, in a different conversation, this has provoked many things that I will be asking mm -hmm. about, you know, how did we get to this point? This is outside, again, it's not the yeah. capital facilities mm -hmm. uh, authority, but uh, other boards do have mm -hmm. oversight of this. So I think these should be raised in those, mm -hmm. in those arenas. I agree so, with Mr. Alonzo on this. I, I would, um, I'm, I'm I, I think we need to be thoughtful about making sure that all of our vehicles that we have, somebody at some point in municipal government has said, this is the, the fleet of vehicles we should have to fully service the town. Like we should be thinking about, okay, if we don't have that vehicle, we should replace it. You know, and, and I think what you're effectively telling us here is we don't have this vehicle right now, so. Right. And compounding the issue is the fact that it's going to take us three to four times as long right. to get those vehicles as it would have five years ago. Right. Or even yeah. two years ago. Mm -hmm. So if this is on 2026, which is two years, two years from now, and we're talking about two years from now, ordering a vehicle is going to take a year to deliver at least. Yeah, I think this probably needs to be reevaluated in priority. Right. So I could speak to that a little bit. I believe it was the FY22 uh, capital budget. There was a truck that, a three quarter ton truck, pickup truck, that was supposed to be the director's truck. Uh, that's been ordered. That's hopefully in a month or so, it should come in. So that can make up a little bit of the difference in this one. Okay, so there is a plan for how to deal yeah. with this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, um, in FY26, we'll, we will be looking to replace our catch basin cleaning truck. So currently we have um, a large Mac truck. Um, recently, we went to, some of the guys went to the um, uh, DPW Expo and they have smaller trucks now. It's, well, you can't see it there, but it's it's like an F550. Uh, it's, it's, Smaller, a lot less expensive, a lot easier to drive. Um, you know, the town's small enough. We don't need the big truck. We don't need to be filling it up. We can take you know, multiple trips to empty as needed. It's, uh, it, I think it would serve us better than a bigger truck. Bill, has there been any, and, and I realize you have been in town long enough to know, but maybe some of the other guys that have been around for a while, um, made any comments about the transition away from sand and how much less work this truck has had to do on an annual basis to clean catch basins and, and so on and so forth. Uh, I agree the town needs to own a vehicle like this. Mm -hmm. I don't think uh, 
hiring it out makes any sense in my mind anyway. Um, but is there any comments that you've heard as the difference in one season versus the next since we've gotten out of getting away from sand? I don't believe so. And, and it's mostly because we can't get to every catch basin. Um, <clears throat> we should be getting, you know, every one, every two years or so. It's taken us about five or six years to get to every the rotation. Yeah. <laughs> so. I, I would submit to you that there are some catch basins that have not been hit in 10 years. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But but um, but does it take, I mean, theoretically, if you were hitting every catch basin every two years, would your workload be less because of salt versus sand? Theoretically, yes. And another reason why we can get away with a smaller chart. And the other question is relative. I was just going to say, and obviously, storm water runoff is the other big issue that not using yeah. sand is going to really help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, so the the other question um, relative to this truck, it, so does this truck just gets used for uh, catch basins only? Is it a single purpose vehicle? It is, yes. So we don't plow with the with truck seventeen right now. That's correct. Okay. Um, do we have a plow for it if we wanted to? I don't believe it's set up the plow at all, no. Okay. Um, there's been discussion in town because of some of the new drainage systems that exist. I think, for example, the one on uh, Butterfly Lane, um, which the town is responsible for and should be maintaining. Um, the only way to service that type of system is with a vacuum truck. Um, and I don't know what we're doing to deal with that. I think it might only be a one-off or maybe there's only a few in town that are like that. Uh, but I've also been told that vacuum trucks make catch basin maintenance a whole lot easier as well, but they cost like a million dollars or something. Um, is that anything that you have an opinion on? Yeah, definitely. The vacuum truck would cost you upwards to a million dollars. Um, I'm not familiar with butter. What did you say? Butterfly. Butterfly. It's, a, it's, a, it's called the sack <laughs> development several it, years ago. So did they not use like a traditional catch basin? Because this it's got, know, the, it's no, got it's a specialized one kind that of requires system. It has a it has it's one that's you know allowable, but it's not standard and it does require this vacuum truck. And that was one of the big contention points by several members. Sure. Of different committees in town asking about the maintenance of that catch basin. Yeah, I'll have to look into that. I'm not familiar with that type of system. Yeah. Hmm. It was it was of some controversy when the town approved the road uh, yeah. final approval, but yeah. it somehow got built into the plan, and and we were there was discussion at the time that. It was the first, but probably would not be the last given modern engineering, but that's about as much as I understand. All right, and then uh, also FY26, just a, a replacement of one of our one ton dump trucks. It's just a uh, life expectancy of about 10 years. So this truck here, is a 2016, so it would be 10 years old, be due for a replacement. These are our you know, everyday trucks. This is what the guys are out in mm -hmm. every day, every job. What hell was in the fire today? <laughs> yeah. Some of them do. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. So again, another one that's just about at its 10 years. So we'll be looking at replacing another 110 in FY26. Is any of this equipment used to maintain the parking lots at the schools or do they have their own equipment? The school pretty much maintains our own, um, but we do salt the school uh, driveways. Okay. 
Yeah, they do their own plowing, but we do the salting. That's a bit of a shift, isn't it, from say five years ago? There was, as um, you were talking about five years ago. Yeah, yeah we there there were some there were some uh, vacancy issues and a bunch of other issues that, but the the schools are responsible for plowing um, the the school properties, and that part of the the discussion around that three quarter ton truck on the school request is a sander that will pick up. Uh, that work from the DPW and and I, I personally think there's a there's a there's a couple of needs reasons for that. Number one is diverting the DPW from a road when you need to you know sand a school driveway when there's been a delayed opening or a, a late night theater performance or something like that. Um, but but also just you know making the schools more reactive to changes in weather conditions even during a normal day. Um, the, you would ask the question, and I know I'm getting off topic here, Dave, but um, about that sander um, and going onto a three quarter ton truck. Um, but the school did recently get an appropriation for a one ton. So even yeah. if we buy that as a as as a unit on a three quarter ton, it'd be very easily to very easy to just put that sander on the one ton. One ton. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so this is just a replacement of an existing uh, sort of bucket loader tractor that we have. This one's a 2000, so. I got to see that in action on uh, Lancaster uh, Ave's uh, sidewalk. Yeah, yeah. Landscaping work. Yeah. Interesting little tractor. It did well, but in FY26, it's gonna be quite old, so yeah. it'd be ready for a replacement. Uh, this is a new request for a mini excavator. So, again, we do a lot of drainage work. Um, right now, most of the drainage work we have to uh, give it to contractors, and this is the equipment they're using. If we had it in house, we could do some of this ourselves. Uh, it's, you know, it's a versatile machine. Uh, we'd have to have a trailer for it, too. Um, but this would help our operations. All right, this is FY29 now. Uh, this is a utility body truck. Um, which one is this truck three? This is the truck that I am driving now. Uh, again, it should be assigned to facilities. Um, when a gentleman is, who's out sick comes back, it, it should go to him. That other truck I spoke of, the three quarter ton, um, I'm, I'm probably going to grab that one. This will go back to facilities where it belongs. Yeah. Bill, do you no. know? And, and I think Peter's asked this question before too, where the transition started. We may be on the same thing. I know Peter. what you're going to ask. Go ahead. <laughs> um, the maintenance and, and handling of these vehicles, is that gonna stay with DPW yet facilities is going to be using them? In other words, maintenance, repair, and replacement will be under DPW? I believe so, because it's not just a facility truck, it's a plow truck also. So it's that's kind of a gray area, I agree. It's kind of where facilities and DPW cross, and it's with you know there's one another areas. It kind of consolidates the fleet into one department. Yeah, there's there's a plus for it there, maybe. Yeah, uh, I'm done, Peter. <laughs> yeah, so I, Dave asked a little bit different question, but the same kind of theme. Um, and again, a little bit outside of the purview of this committee, but I, I think it I think it matters with respect to responsibility and maintenance of equipment. Um, that and and again, just advice to our select board member. I, I think that. This probably requires some kind of written MOU or something that the select board approves that just delineates the responsibilities relating to this equipment between what are now, you know, on the books, two separate departments. Um, and I completely agree that, you know, we should be looking for efficiencies where they exist. And if, if it makes sense for the DPW to track and request this vehicle and maintain it, then so be it. But I, I don't, I, I do think that we need to be very clear in terms of who's responsible for what. 
Yeah, I know that because we just created the facilities department as a separate entity, that will be a work in progress as we go forward. Yeah. I will also editorialize that we went from 2026 to 2029, but given the, given the status that I'm hearing from the vehicles, there is no way in the world that we are not seeing the requests in 2027 and 2028. <laughs> All right, this is a twin to the, the last chart. We have two of them. Uh, again, it's just a, a replacement at the end of its useful life. And again, this is a facilities. But um, going back to what Peter and Dave just talked about, is there is, you know, we asked for a, an MOU between departments. Is there something like that for police and fire because DPW is maintaining their vehicles also? No, that's not, this is outside of the scope. Yeah. So that's okay. I mean, we, yeah. this is an, something to be addressed with the town manager and the you know and and the, the select yeah. board and you know the finance director and everything about how these are going to be maintained. We need a way to delineate what departments, even if they are under other departments, what they cost. I've, this has been a yeah. kind of a I don't want to say a pet peeve, but certainly a focus that I'd like to see. I'd like to see more detailed things of okay. If DPW does the maintenance of the vehicles and public safety, we should be knowing what that is costing separate from DPW costs. Right. Well, but there are separate budgets for you know DPW vehicles, police vehicles, fire vehicles. Right. right. So, I mean, so in some regard, they probably these yeah. records are being kept. They're yeah. just not easy when we ask for them to be determined. So maybe yeah. maybe it's not the data gathering that's the problem. Maybe it's the data reporting. That needs to have more attention. So, so the, Mr. Alonzo, just and I, I understand this, the 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 purview issue here, but you know this this issue came up last year during the discussion around the facilities department, and there is a difference between what we're doing here and what happens with the schools or the fire department or the police department, which is. The aforementioned departments all request their own vehicles on their own capital plan, and they have maintenance lines in their budget uh, relative to maintaining those vehicles. Um, and they share the resource of the town mechanic, which is part of the DPW. In, in this case, because the department is new, um, we haven't figured that out yet. And I, I understand that. But I was given assurances at the, at the time during the spring when, when I was a member of the finance committee and we were discussing this, that that would all be worked out at the time that the department was established. And, and here we are five months later, and to my knowledge, there, there isn't a plan. Well, I could comment on this. I will not. These need to be brought up to other departments other than the capital planning. I hear your issue, but we're not going to talk about how budgets, departments, and the capital planning, you know, not, the discussion is not going to go very far because it doesn't have much of a point in our purview. So I, I would recommend that you go to the fi finance committee and the, and the select board to you know, raise these, and I think they're valid points. This is just not a place that we're going to discuss them because we really don't have any authority in this regard. Uh, yeah, I think we can move. Uh, again, an FY29 would be looking at a replacement of our current fresh chipper. Uh, this one is uh, 2001, so be pretty old at that time. Doesn't have too many hours when I've beaten it up all that much. Um, actually, a lot of our tree work, we, we have to give the contractors. Uh, we don't have a bucket truck, so this <clears> is... Well, to, I think again, I'll, yeah. I will editorialize to say that too many hours, it's yeah. it seemed two hours a year. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if that number is accurate. I'd have to okay, well, that's a different story. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm looking yeah. at 41 hours for yeah. something that's 20, 2001. I'm like, okay, yeah. so that's 21 yeah. years and 41 hours. It doesn't make sense, right? Yeah, it could be that the gauge is broken. Okay. <laughs> 41 hours for 25 years. Yeah. <laughs> this is our, our replacement, uh, schedule replacement of our current front end loader. Uh, it'd be aged out in FY29. And we're in FY30. 
30 now. This is a replacement for our current backhoe. Um, it would be aged out at that time. Quick question on that, mm -hmm. uh, where it's a dual department use vehicle. With the small amount that the cemetery department requires a backhoe, please consider, I guess I'll put it that way, because this is a, a bit of a distance out that this vehicle be committed to cemetery use, which will give you your backhoe full time under DPW. I'll leave it at that. Well, we can the, the mini excavator that we're looking at that could also be used at the cemetery. I'll leave it alone. We'll talk about it some other Okay. <laughs> All right, FY30, uh, uh, looking at replacing one of our good working plow trucks. So, and FY30 will be aged out to be ready for replacement. Again, this is a, a, a standard replacement of a, one of our one ton trucks at, at 10 years old. That's about what we can expect out of them. This is, again, a one of our good working plow trucks in, in FY31, it'll be ready for replacement. This is our um, lawnmower that's used at the cemeteries. Uh, it, it would just be a replacement, so that's, this is fairly new. So FY31, it'd be ready for a replacement. This is a, again a replacement of our current road sweeper. Um, yeah, it would be ready to go by that time. And that's what I have for equipment. Yeah, on that on that last item, mm -hmm. um, it's been kicked around a couple of times as these sweepers have been replaced over the years. Mm -hmm. um, Again, you're new in town, so mm -hmm. this question might be more appropriate a year or two from now. But do we really have a need to own a street sweeper versus hiring it out to sweep the roads? What is it, twice a year maximum that we need to cover the whole town? Again, we're not we're not getting the whole town. We don't. We just don't have the manpower. But we should be doing a lot more sweeping. Uh, I could look at cost, but I'm gonna guess over the life of this vehicle, it would be cheaper to have the vehicle than to use contract here. Okay. Yeah. Again, we're talking so many years out right now. Yeah. The the uh, detailed conversations can be had later. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on the vehicle before we go on to the facilities? Infrastructure, sorry. Uh, one other comment on vehicles. I kind of I put together an inventory. Um, I know when I first arrived there, they said there was no inventory of DPW vehicles. So I, I put something together. I can anybody who wants it, I can email it to them. Yes, please. I, yeah, yeah. yeah. I put together, you know, the, the year to make the model, description of what it is, and in a, in a picture. So. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. And then I also have just a, a straight list, same same information, but just a list. But can those, be, can pictures, those be forwarded so to us? They can. Okay, yeah. please. Yeah. And and to the town manager, we should probably put them yeah. as public documents on the website. Yeah. 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 All right. So now we're going to go to. Um, Infrastructure projects. Hey, Bill, take it away. Again. All right, we go to the next slide. So, again, I tried to spread it out, you know, per fiscal year, uh, so we can see how the money's being spent. Uh, you jump right to the next one. So the first one is a uh, culvert replacement. It, this would be for the 
uh, to do a survey, a design permitting of the, of the job. Um, so we'd have to hire a consultant engineer to put a, to, to do that work, the design and the survey and get the permitting done for us and get it out to bid. So this is a request for that. Um, currently this culvert's in kind of tough shape. Uh, the road has sunk a little bit, you know, from, uh, they must have leaks somewhere. So it's at the end of its life. Are we looking at anything of the same severity that's going on at Flathill that we may look at closing a lane of the road or anything? Not at this time. Okay. No. Okay. No. I, I'm sorry. I'm I'm unfamiliar with Kelly's Pond. Where where is this? Um, if if you at um, Chase Road. Uh, Lanny's. Uh, if you go North Fail Road towards um, towards Fitchburg, yep. it's just down there. Past just the golf lines. course? No. Before the golf course. course. Okay. Yeah. Right Peter, it's, it's in the low spot right off of uh, Chase Road on North Field Road. Yeah. Okay. Kelly's Pond is right there. Uh, and this is before it's... where they're going to do that or where they're doing that cut for um, Pierce Farm? It's right there. It's right at it. Yeah. Right at oh, it's right at it. it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so this is a request for funds to do some drainage work at Flat Hill Road at Cortland Circle. I know it's been an ongoing issue for many years. Um, we have an engineer working on it now. Uh, he's come up with a few ideas. Um, we're trying to work out what we can do. So there's money there for him to put a uh, contract together. This would be the funds to, to do whatever drainage work we have to do there. Do we have a final report or recommendation from the work that, that we appropriated? We have an engineer report. Uh, the engineer report came in just recently, yes. And this two hundred forty thousand dollars is reflective of the estimate that came in that report. No, no, that that report concentrated on um, studying Cortland Circle. That, um, was it built to the specs that the, the planning board approved? And it came back. It, basically, it did. Yes, that it was built correctly, but it was it hasn't been maintained. So that report kind of focused on maintenance of the existing infrastructure on Cortland Circle. So, I mean, there's been a ton of speculation in terms of what can be done here to mitigate the problem. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've been in and out of listening to meetings that, that this issue has been discussed at. So my I'm not sure that my my knowledge is continuous on this. I guess my question is, are we confident that this is going to work? This is a lot of money. And I've yet to see a, a description of a plan that my non-engineering mind can get my head around. Like when you've got such a high water table, is this an issue that can be dealt with? It is. So what we're looking at potentially is, is piping the water, you know, catching the water as it comes off a of Cortland Circle, putting it in new pipes. The problem is where do we put it? So there's a couple of options. The, probably the best option is put it on private property. We need permission to do that. So that's something we're exploring. So what is this $240,000 going to give us given that we don't know what we're doing with the water and really what infrastructure is going to need to be put in there to bring it to one of X number of options. Because on the private property, I would think is the cheapest way to do it because you don't have to go any distances. The, the other discussions I've heard is taking it all the way down to Page Street and then you start causing problems downstream from there. Mm -hmm. So I, I personally haven't heard an answer that brings us to a point where we can fund a project. That's what I'm trying to say right now. 
And I understand it's been yeah. dragged out for years. I do understand right. that. But to spend 240, which will probably turn into $300,000 before we get done uh, and not fix the problem is a real concern. Or to appropriate the money without a plan, Dave. I mean, you know, right, there, right. I, I there's, a, yes. there's a property owner. I mean, the, the speculation has all happened here, right? There's a, there's a, we all understand that we could potentially drain this thing downhill to the east. The problem is, is that you have a, a property owner that doesn't want this done across his property, to my knowledge, right now. So un, until there's a plan that includes, you know, an, agree, an agreement to easements or whatever is required. I, I just, you know, we, there was a discussion at last night's select board meeting about, about capital planning items that have remained open for a long period of time, and some of them will never be appropriated. And like, this just strikes me as speculative at this point. I tend to agree with, with both of your comments. Yeah, we, we don't have an engineer plan. So this number is just kind of a ballpark mm -hmm. to, to get us the money to do the work that needs to be done there in a timely fashion. We can get the plan, push it off a year or two, but that doesn't help the abutters who are getting flooded now. And, and I'm sympathetic to that situation. I understand and I don't want to I know I'm probably coming across as very un unsympathetic. I, I don't want to come across that way. And by the way, I don't, I would be okay with combining the engineering and the construction together. I mean, that that's not a problem. I understand that. But I also understand that water flows downhill. And and if you we don't have a place to put the water, I'm sure the engineering is feasible if you have a place to put it, right? But if we don't have a place to put it, I, I mean, I have a degree in political science, so I don't understand any of the engineering stuff, right? But I, I do understand the basics. We need a route to direct that water to. And if that can't be articulated, I, I just can't get my head around a $240,000 appropriation. Yeah, and, and Peter, one other comment too, is the money that was spent to get us to this point with the engineer, I believe was originally appropriated for construction. And- um, that was not my yeah. understanding, Dave. No, but it, it wasn't. It was, it was to hire somebody to investigate what Mr. Bernard just said, which is you know, to make sure that the, oh. the, the flow of water drainage was built according to spec that was approved. And also, as noted in the, the last sentence of this description, and also identifying a cause of, if, if it was built to spec, then why are they getting the flooding? Then if they are getting the flooding for reasons, and we, we are speculative about what that reason is, which is a, an, an elevated water table that just historically is high, uh, how do we deal with it? That lends itself to the engineering part. I agree with those people who said that getting without the engineering plan, it's hard to know what the number is. And I think no matter what the engineering plan is, if we're looking to say, will this be sufficient? I think the answer is always going to be, it, it's groundwater. It's hard to know the answer to that. You know, this is not somebody doing something that's finite. If you build a house, you can build a house, right? This is dealing with water that is seasonal, that has highs and lows, that is changing according to, you know, rain flows and absorption rates, et cetera. So no matter what the engineering plan is, unless it's build a bottomless pit at the end of some pipe, there's no way of knowing whether it's going to be sufficient at any point. I respectfully disagree that the scope of the work was not repurposed, but I will do my homework before I bring it up again. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, so for disclosure, this is another bundle. <laughs> <laughs> so this is for the cemetery to um, uh, basically trim the hedges, uh, restore the turf, restore headstones, and to lay out new plots. So that yep, I understand now bundling is not the way to go, but uh, some of these are under the 20,000, but at the same time, it's kind of outside of our current budget. 
So I, uh, like the, the hedges, we, we kind of piecemeal it over a couple of years. There's still a bunch to go based on work that we've already done. We estimated we have, need another $11,000 to, to finish the hedges. Um, we looked at restoring the turf. Um, we had a professional come in and talk to the cemetery commission. He gave us a, a price of about $50,000 to uh, restore the turf um, by top dressing would be the um, preferred method, It'd be the best way to, uh, to feed the grass. Um, <clears throat> then there's uh, lots of older monuments from the 1700s and the 1800s. Um, we had a monument company come in that can restore these. He gave us a price. Uh, of, it was basically um, not a price to get them all, but to it was basically a day price in so many days. That was uh, $16,500. That'll get a, a bunch of the older headstones restored. And the last piece was the uh, survey that we need done to lay out the plots in the new section of the North Cemetery. Um, any questions? You have a number on that one, Bill. Which one? The survey. They're the survey was $4,100. Oh, I'm sorry. So, so uh, I, I have a, a, a several questions here. On the on the hedges, um, and I, I understand that they have not, there was an issue we had a couple of years ago around this property and the, the maintenance. Um, is there any kind of specialized work that's required for these hedges or is it just a matter of catching up uh, to the point that, you know, and I'm, I'm imagining it requires some specialized equipment because they've gotten so out of control, but I mean, are, this isn't like an arborist or anything. It's just getting, getting somebody with the right equipment in there to catch up with the, the overgrowth that's occurred? Correct. So what we've used to do the pieces we've already done, we had two different tree companies come in and they, they used a bucket truck. And yeah, one crew was a smaller crew. They did a nice piece. And the other crew that came in, they, they used a bigger crew, knocked out a big piece pretty quick, but it, it does add up quick too. But yeah, like you said, they're so tall, you need the bucket truck to, to get in there and do it right. It, but after this is done, that would be it, right? We have a maintenance plan to not have to do this again. Yeah, we, well, we'd have to yearly, you know, keep an eye on it. And, but it, yeah, we won't have to go this extensive in the future. So I would suggest that the bundling in this case, I could, I could see the turf and maybe even the monuments mm -hmm. because their size, I would probably recommend that the first one and the fourth one just be asked for and the, the, the operating budget, they're small enough and you just ask for the appropriation in the operating budget for those two. I'm not, I'm not averse to the yeah. money. I just don't think the yeah. capital plan is the way to do those mm -hmm. one and four. Yeah, I, by the way, I think that, that that survey absolutely has to be done because we're, yeah. we've talked about this for a couple of years and <laughs> I don't know how many plots we sell a year, but we're getting pretty, we're, we're getting pretty close. Um, but I, I tend to agree with Mr. Alonzo on this. And, and I, by the way, I, this is a property we're obliged, I mean, we have to maintain this, the historical. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I want to make sure that it's known that I think the DVW and the cemetery department has done a great job in restoring so much of these areas. Yep. I, so it's a, it's a testament to the work they do. I mean, I, I, I know that the chair of the cemetery commission is here with us tonight. If he's still chair, are you still chair? Yes. Okay. So well, I wanna, <laughs> no, I didn't know if you had a reorganization. But so, no. so, uh, so it's, not, it's not a question about the, I'm more than happy to appropriate the money. I just think, the avenue for two of those things is this is not the avenue. That's all. Yeah. I think they should be asked for in the in the line item operating budget for those two items, and you know there should be no reason why they wouldn't be able to get them there. Yeah. yeah. By the way, I you know once again just to kind of and I, I 
I know Mr. Tyler is is you know much more expert than I am here, but you know this uh, the the historical value of of some of those markers. If you go walking through there, I went through there with my son, you know, several years ago when he was really young, and you know, just looking at the names and dates on on some of those markers, um, it's it really you know it it it, it it's awesome, and and we we have got we have got to take care of this. Totally agree. Could I get a, just a very brief description as to what restore means in this case? Right. Um, Bill, can you speak on that better? Or, yeah, that's yeah. basically the majority of the stones of mm -hmm. over, over you know, 300 years that, you know, can you, like can you come a little closer so sure. I can pick you up there? Yeah. Thanks. Oh, um, maybe over in the chair. That's what you well, can sit if you want. Yeah. Well, basically, over you know two or three hundred years, you know, the slate headstones they start off when they're you know, straight, but they just they tilt one way or the other. Um, that's the majority of them. Um, the other parts, sometimes they tilt, sometimes they snap and break. There's uh, there's many many ones that are broken. We have the, you know, the pieces, but they have to be professionally uh, put back with uh, you know some sort of a epoxy and, and rods, and it's quite a it's not just a matter of putting blue or anything like you have to do it a certain way. Um, does that kind of answer your? Yeah, my only concern is that it doesn't include trying to wash clean or restore the surfaces of these headstones, because I think the <laughs> historic value is in the. I understand yeah. you and I have talked about this, yeah. and I've, I've spent yeah. my life in that cemetery yeah. growing up as a little kid. Um, I understand the stones lean over, they fall over, some are broken, so yeah. on and so forth. I can understand that part of it. Yeah. But to go in and wholesale pressure wash in or chemical treat to clean them, to bring them back to clean stone, I personally don't agree with. You don't think it should be? No. no. Uh -huh. If that's, that's why I asked what resource. No, well, that means. wasn't part of it. I mean, I, I think um, when you say pressure wash, they don't really do that. I mean, it, it's, it's pressure, but it's not like, uh, you know, like a sandblasting something. They put a chemical on it and wash it off, basically. Uh, I've seen what they do in some of those stones and they don't hurt it. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt it. I mean, it, it makes it readable. Um, because there's all kinds of lichen and, and like other kind of things on there that they're cleaning off of there. Yeah. But I, no. would, I would also note that Mr. Tyler is part of the historical society. So I think he's very sensitive to the historical link <laughs> Yeah. And I find, yeah, I, I don't believe he would do anything that would you know, compromise the historical value of the stones. No, no, there's companies out there that, that are very adept at doing that, not, you know, hurting, hurting stones. Yeah. One other question, Bill, and, and I had a conversation with a uh, town employee about this uh, in the last few days, and that is, could you explain what uh, perpetual care is in relationship to any one of the plots of the cemeteries, what what it entails or or what it what it quote end quotes pays for, but really doesn't pay for because it's such a small amount. Right, it, it's two hundred dollars per plot, and basically it just ensures that there will be um, the grass will be cut, the leaves will be picked up and be cleaned up, um, maybe reseeding if needed. Um, it doesn't it doesn't cover you know, headstone repair or anything like that, uh, uh, damage to it or things like that, but it's just a natural care for it, you know, grass cutting and that, that sort of thing. That's I, that as you know, I, I know that explanation, but I just wanted the public to hear yeah. it because you do have, a, you know, you can draw those funds on an annual basis, the interest from the interest money those funds, yes. to, to help offset costs to do what you just said, yeah. but it nowhere near covers all that cost. No. No, and, and that's you know, just to harken back to what, what Bill had said earlier that, um, and I agree with, with, with everybody that you know, a couple of those items probably shouldn't be on there because it, it's, it's, that, they can, you know, it's maintenance, but um, there's no way we'd ever get that kind of money or at least historically get that kind of money in the DPW budget to do it. Um, at the point right now, we get $7,500 a year for what we call purchase services which is tree cutting, um, that sort of hedge work, that's what that came from. So um, 
at that rate that would take an eternity to get these things done. So outside of the scope of this meeting, but I will say it anyway, because we certainly run afoul of this our purview, but as select board member for a second, there is no reason why you can't submit those to be placed in the budget for the DPW under those references. That you, you shouldn't be hardwired into a number. The number that you have should make sense for what you need to do. And that number may vary from year to year because you're not always going to be doing the hedging. So you need to get finished. You should be able to put that in. I, I don't, I, I would, I would lobby for it. I would speak in favor of it, but there's no reason why it shouldn't be included in the DPW budget when he submits it to the town manager. Yeah, that's, Absolutely. that's, that's, that's a fair enough. That's a good point. It is, you know, but um, we just have to try and see and, and you know, I mean, it's, it's up to the town manager how much she's going to put into the budget. I understand, so. but there are influences too. So yeah. I think I think getting a number without a narrative, yeah. as I've said for many times on the FinCom, you know, if you have the data with, without a narrative or you have the narrative without the data, it ain't gonna work. So right. if you have what these are for specifically, then I think it, it should be, and you, you have a, a track record of what you've already done with the progress, but this is the this is the number to finish that process. People can see what has done to the the you know beautification and the maintenance of the cemetery. So I mean, with the exception of the of the of the grass turf, where, uh, you know, it's those are mostly the other ones are one time things. Right. You know, so it's not like it wouldn't be in the budget every year. It, and that's what, it, so this comes into another argument that we've, or another discussion, not argument, discussion. We've had at the select board about planning, you know, why some things when we raise the, 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 the uh, entrance level of a capital planning project, I indicate that, like, there should be stuff in the fluctuates in the operating budget that's under 20,000, and maybe you get it one year, and then maybe next year you don't need it again. I mean, that should be a normal evolution of an operating budget. Whereas a capital plan is like, there's no way, you know, there's no way that should $100,000 or $50,000 or anything should be out of an operating budget because it's a specific thing. You know, replacing the turf is a specific large capital project. Yeah, I agree. Well, I thank you for your input on that and explanation. Thank you, Bill. Yep. All right, moving on to FY25, looking at another COVID. Uh, this would be for the the actual construction of the COVID replacement at Kelly's Pond. Okay, yeah. makes sense. Mm -hmm. Bill, do you think, well, uh, it's only two years away. Uh, based on what you've heard so far on the projects that are actually in the pipeline now, is there going to be any funding available that could offset this? Uh, I don't think it qualifies for small bridge, but is there anything else? Yeah, there may be the grants out there. I'm not sure for this size cover, it's, it's basically a pipe. Yeah. I don't know if there's anything for this type of work. And, and, and the, you know, again, I haven't been very close to it for stormwater or there. Is there money out there floating around for stormwater projects or no? Not that I've seen, but I would say in the future that there will be. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. This could be an earmark, couldn't it? Well, I would it could be requested, sure. All right. Uh, in FY25, this is. Um, Another COVID job, this is also on North Fair Road. This is uh, just east of Holman Street. And this is again for the engineering to, to, to put that job together to replace this culvert. Uh, this one is a lot deeper than the, the other one down the street. It's, um, and there's, there's two pipes on this one. I haven't found any plans. Uh, what's existing, but on one end there's one pipe, on the other end there's two pipes. So this one is a little more involved. So the cost would be a little, a little more. Uh, so FY26, this would be the construction for the replacement of the, the Northfield Road Covenant at East of Holman Street. Um, again, the cost is high because 
it sits down pretty low. Uh, it was gonna be a big cut in the road to do this job. So it, it, there will be more costs than the, uh, the one at Kelly's Pond. That one's pretty shallow. Bill, are there actually two uh, water flows that join here and then head downstream? I, I believe there is, right? Yeah, because one, there are one two comes bikes. from Marshall Pond yeah. and down through. And then I'm not sure the other one is, I think, from Holman Street behind the cemetery. I remember yeah. that. What is the dire direction of the water here? Does it go in pipe and out too, or the other way around? Yeah, so my top picture that's with all the stone that's where it's going in. The picture that's, so that's kind of hidden okay. is uh, that's the outflow. Yeah, yeah. that's the outflow. Right. Yeah, and again, repairs have been made here in the past. Uh, you know, we can't see it here live, but um, one of the pipes is concrete, and the other one is had a different material, yeah, way different time. Frame. Yeah, yeah, so and there's all riprap on the you know, if you look at the picture on the right side of the road, so it has been repaired a little bit. But it is sinking. You know, if you drive there, you can you can almost see it in the picture. You got a little sink. There's a little bit of history of uh, upstream from there. Uh, large, large, large amounts of water being released all at one time, and could have very easily taken out that mm -hmm. culvert. The amount of water that was released all at once. Great. That's what I have for now. Oh, hold on a second. What happened? I believe. Right? Yeah, you missed the yeah, salt. Oh, you're right. You're right. Yeah, there but, uh, what is. There we go. Yeah, sorry. Sorry about that. So I put this one on here. The, a salt barn. I don't. Not quite sure when it was built. Best I could tell is in the 70s sometime. Uh, doesn't look too, too bad, but it has been hit by the loader on a couple of occasions. There's one spot where it's kind of hanging off. I tried to get a picture that I saw it was in the way. Um, the outside picture on the top right there, you can see the, the outside sheathing is kind of tough shape. Ideally, we'd like to have a door on the salt shed, try to keep moisture out. This one does not have a door. <laughs> so, and then I, I took it just, a, this is just an estimate on cost, but I'm, I'm sure it's not gonna be cheap. So I kind of spread it out over two years. Okay. So I okay. like 27 or so 28. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's so, kind of what we did. We that's what you're looking for on the bottom? So yeah, to look for, not quite as big as that one, but. <laughs> But something more on that one. Yeah. Bill, so how would you spread spread the expenditure out over two years on a on a building of this sort? I'm just well, trying to understand yeah. you buy the building and store it for a year and then you put well, it out the next well, you year. just get the money one year, wait for the next appropriation to uh, uh, go okay. ahead and go, right? Instead of just uh, that's dropping fine. it all on. Yeah, we would we would talk as the time when we do that. Yeah. yeah. So, so this this would be similar to the structure like down at uh, 495 and no, not 495. Well, it's down here 495. The DOT maintains a salt uh, yeah. depot on Route 2 Way near the railroad tracks in uh, Littleton. And they've had to repair that building once, but I think it was under warranty from wind damage. So it's that that type of building. Yeah, it's, it's not yeah. it's not new tech technology, excuse me. No. George, you have a question? So, is it possible to repurpose that building to store vehicles in it? Or would you tear it down and just put another one? Yeah. Uh, yeah, the existing one. I don't know that we have space to put another building, but that'd be a big consideration. So, yeah. And it's it's getting its you know, share of uh, use, and the, the salt isn't good for any material so yeah, yeah. so so on that fabric building um you know i think dave made reference to the the one over in littleton there's there's also one in the cloverleaf at 495 and 93 i believe or somewhere in that area maybe on maybe route three i'm, I'm not exactly sure um that that also had a similar issue five or six years ago where a good portion of the roof came off of it. Um, 
you know, as I look at that, the existing building is 45 plus years old. We'd be looking at something that is not really permanent. Would it be worth trying to repair or come up with a permanent replacement for that building? Yeah, yeah, we could also look at repair or, uh, or you know, a wood structure. We could look at that also, yeah. The, the other thing that DOT did down there in the Littleton uh, location is they refurbished the two wooden structures that have been there for years. Mm -hmm. uh, this fabric building was an addition to the original buildings. Mm -hmm. Right. <clears throat> So, um, sorry, last, last question. Is the town, has, has the town completed the, the paving program? Are we still paving streets or are we done? We're all paving streets. streets. Yeah, we're yeah. all. Oh, I, yeah. I, I, there's there's an ongoing pavement management plan. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I just didn't see it in here. So I just. No, no, that wouldn't be part of capital plan. That's part of the operating budget that we put aside. Okay, yeah. all right. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Right. And so, you know, the, the plan that was, I forget what year it started, but we're basically at the end of the, the latest um, pavement management plan. So we've already started a new plan. We fired an engineer. Uh, they surveyed all the roads with a, a new technology. So we have tons of data on that. Um, they're starting to give us reports on, you know, what we should be doing going forward. Um, the first comment they made was in his 12 years of doing this type of work, he's never seen a score, overall score so high. So our roads are in great shape. It's something to be very proud of. Yeah. You know, all the citizens who, who paid for this should be very proud of that. Yeah. And we want to keep it that way, right? So I see us doing a lot of like maintenance type overlays, thin overlays. Um, Crack sailing, that kind of work to, to maintain our roads, which is a lot cheaper or so than milling and paving. There are some stretches we get a mill and pave. There are some stretches where we, we have to go a little further, but there's much smaller now. So, so we'll, we'll be paving forever, <laughs> essentially. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. One, one quick question, though, mm -hmm. I'm done for the night. Um, <laughs> another, another, excuse me, a number of the overlays that have been done in the last few years just to bring a surface back to something that was workable until the road actually came up for its uh, full covering. Uh, we've gone over all of the uh, accesses to water main valves and catch basin covers. Um, I really was surprised how well the road surface is held up with a thin layer of hot top over the metal covers. Um, for the time being, are we going to stay in, in that mode and not worry about raising those <coughs> prospect street is, is the one in particular that I drive off from? That's the only one that I know of where they went over covers. It's it's not standard practice. It's not something we would do going forward. Okay. Thank you. I think there was extenuating circumstances on that. I don't know, but any further questions for the DPW director? Mr. Chair. Well, oh, time manager. Hold on a second. Let's uh Okay. I didn't have any questions, but I had some comments. Very choppy. So the, I just want to go back to some of the things that were raised. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Some of the things that were raised um, under the equipment. The um, one of the trucks that's listed for fiscal twenty four with a new ID number for 23 should be switched with the uh, fiscal year 25 for that same truck. That truck has been on the plan and it was listed to be replaced in fiscal 24. That's for the 10 wheeler. So it's um, DPW 1708 that's been on the plan for some time. Okay.
Um, also, I'm sorry, wrong number. The DPW 17-14, which is the six wheeler was requested. Um, it's been requested for 24 for many years. That's one, the, of, the, that's one of the two trucks, Heather? I'm yeah, so Bill's, Bill's slideshow shows um, two six wheelers for fiscal 24 and one for 25. One of those 24 ones has been requested for some time. Oh, okay. Um, and for that, the same fiscal year, fiscal 24. Um, just some history on the six wheeler that was funded in, uh, it was appropriated in fiscal 22. It was ordered in 23. And that was all due to supply problems. Um, I reported that throughout the year um, with updates from the DPW director at that time, uh, the issues that uh, we were having with ordering equipment uh, with no phone calls back. They would say it's ordered, then it was not, the order was never submitted. Um, so it was finally finalized when uh, this uh, bill this year. Um, so going back on for fiscal 19 to be replaced in 19, but it wasn't. Um, then it was in fiscal 20, it was requested for fiscal 21. In fiscal 21, it was requested for to be funded in fiscal 21, and it wasn't. Uh, it was finally funded in the fiscal 22 plan. So that's the history going back on that, that vehicle. And um, just a comment on the uh, discussion last night regarding the outstanding projects. Um, I have a different opinion of, of the overview of that. If you look at fiscal 22 and what's outstanding and uh, done, there are some three major projects on that plan that's due to certain project that's uh, 430,000 approximately project. And the two Ritter building projects that are being um, held up until a decision on the windows is decided. And um, if you take those three projects out, it leaves about 163,000 that hasn't been expended. And that's about 10% of that year's plan. We're four months or so into um, fiscal 23 and every single project has had progress on it, um, whether it's reviewing, um, whether we have a looking at the assessment of uh, what's needed for that project. Um, and let's take for instance, the AC for the school. Um, so that project obviously is put on hold, is under review for future alternatives. Um, the foundation at Brooks uh, is being assessed as far as getting a mason in there and knowing if that funding is sufficient and what is gonna be uncovered. So um, of a different opinion of what uh, progress and we're making, I think uh, we're doing very well with progress. And looking back, I don't I know most people's memories are short as far as uh, what we've gone through the last few years. And during COVID things uh, obviously were extremely different scenarios for ordering equipment and getting projects done, getting vendors in, having staff available. Um, so I think in light of all of that, um, we're doing really well. Sure, can I, uh, I want, well, before you go, I want to say, um, I, I, I don't, I, I agree with the town manager. I said that last night at the select board meeting. Uh, I don't want two days of this being brought up to, to, for this to gain any traction because I think it's not, 
It's, it's not accurate. I think the plans that we've had in the past, that there have always been capital plans that have taken longer than the year that they were appropriated. In particular, ones that have to do with aging infrastructure, like all the Vertex product or projects that are talking about the aging buildings, whether it's Ritter, whether it's Town Hall, whether it's the Brooks House, these are going to uncover things that you know we couldn't know in advance, but you can't start until you appropriate the money. And they, like the town manager said, in the current year, uh, there was some comments made about the current year being behind and it's four, year, four months old in fiscal year. So, I mean, I don't really see where the, uh, the comments being made or the criticisms being made are accurate. And I would, I would completely agree with the town manager's assessment on this, as I said last night. Very, yeah, very briefly, uh, this <laughs> that was uh, a real issue to me a number of years ago, probably around the time uh, the town manager came on board here in town. Um, and at that point, I forget the number exactly, but I believe I came up with $1.2 million in capital appropriations that had been sitting for a number of years. And I'm not saying two or three years, I'm saying longer than that. But in, in her tenure, that has been cleaned up so that we're not hanging money out there for 10 years, uh, even five years, unless there's a compelling issue that has held up the project. So uh, I haven't seen the Board of Selectmen's meeting last night. I will now uh, listen to it uh, when I get the chance. But for people that have not been watching it for the last decade or a decade and a half, project money appropriations are not hanging out there like they were five or 10 years ago. So there's been a vast improvement. Having made the, having made the comment that, that uh, I believe the town manager was referring to, um, the, the point that I'm trying to make or was trying to make was that during this process and, and part of our criteria and things that we've discussed in previous meetings is, is that you know, ultimately our role is to, to come up with a prioritization list. And part of, that, part of that discussion needs to be the completeness of these plans and some sort of assessment, whether or not we're entering into a project that may not be resolved. Um, and, you know, this committee did its due diligence last year um, with respect to the, uh, the primary school AC project. I had a different opinion at the time, lobbied other committees, and, and the town manager, to her credit, moved it up the, uh, the prioritization list. It got funded, and wouldn't you know, we're, we're in a quagmire with that, with that project. Um, and, and I understand why, and I probably wouldn't do it differently um, given the circumstances of that project, but given the project that's in front of us, there is no path to resolution that I, that, that's been, that's been articulated to me. And, and why we would, why we would fund a project that does not have a, a clear path to resolution. Um, I, I don't know. I just don't, I, I can't get my head around that because it, it just seems like we're asking for some of those projects that, that Mr. Passios just, just alluded to um, that, that went on for years. Uh, and and uh, that, that was the point. Now, we are also funding many, many, many more projects than we have in, in years past. You know, there's what, 28, 29-ish projects on our list right now. We funded 22 or 23 last year, nearly that same number the year before. Um, that's an awful lot to manage. And, and I, I don't want to put additional unending projects on, on anybody's plate. Um, I, I think we need, to, we need to look for projects that, um, that have a clear path to resolution. Okay. Any other questions for the DPW director who's sitting here patiently while we're having this discussion? Uh, any more for him? Bill, I want to thank you for your presentation, both presentations. Uh, uh, 
So we look forward to, uh, if we have any questions for you, for, you know, then we've asked tonight, we will let them let you know. Um, all right. This, and I wanna thank all, all three presenters tonight and thank you not only for presenting, but for staying in support and listening to the whole meeting. I really appreciate it. This was the last of the presentations of all the capital plan items that are uh, requests that were made. So after tonight's meeting, the committee will be taking up the prioritization questions and discussions of the items on the list and uh, our plan. And I think it's required actually by charter. So we have to get this in the hands of the town manager by the, uh, let's just say for all intents and purposes right before Christmas, no later than that. We're looking for December 15th to uh, have that and we will start those discussions at our next meeting. Um, discussion of capital planning requests. I, mean, I know this has gone long tonight, longer than usual, but we, we needed to catch up because of our mutual <laughs> schedules for all of our other committees that we're all serving on. Does anybody have anything they want to discuss tonight or would everybody want to digest and come to the next meeting ready to uh, discuss more fully. I've got nothing. I look forward to kind of honing down to 2024 rather than what we've been right. going through here, you know, 10, 15 year projections and so on. Agreed. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Okay. So we don't have any approval of minutes tonight. There will be one at the next meeting. The action items for the next meeting are what I just outlined, which is we'll be having a discussion in earnest of the 2024 requests. We have decided, Mr. Passios, I don't know if you've seen this meeting, uh, but our next meeting is scheduled for Monday, November 21st at 6 p.m. Uh, it'll be here in the same building here. And then at that point, we'll probably have to look at what the plan is uh, and play it by ear. Uh, that's a Monday, so we'll have enough time because that's right before Thanksgiving. So we'll decide then and we'll look up, everybody be ready at that meeting to look at some dates. Maybe we'll do it early in the meeting, looking at what dates we can um, to finalize the work. I'm assuming it's gonna take the 21st and probably at least two other meetings uh, to come up to a final list. Uh, if we need to, three, but let's just try to keep it to, to two after that meeting. So. Any final public comment from the committee members? Only that I look forward to uh, further discussion on a number of projects uh, that will be honed down to 2024. I held off on those this evening. I do have a couple of concerns about a couple of them and uh, we'll talk about them when we get to the list. Yep. Any public comment from town manager? No, thank you, though. Thank you. And any public comment from the public? It was nice having a public today. That was very nice. Uh, okay, so next meeting, uh, Monday, November 21st, 6 p.m. here. And I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor, Mr. Martin? Aye. Mr. Brenner? Aye. Mr. Passios? Aye. Mr. Beardmore? Aye. And I for myself. Good night, everyone. We'll see you in a few weeks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.